cyberpunk harem. RMC appears in Star Wars universe. Force powers, space battles, and amazing women compete for his attention. But sadly, the MC is now our... Wait, what? Enlightenment. Earth, Milky Way Galaxy. Today, it was a dark and gloomy night, with flashes of lightning interfering slightly by bringing some light into an otherwise scary darkness. Yeah, no, it was a normal morning, and I was sipping my coffee, while watching a rather competent YouTuber debate the merits of a certain class of Star Destroyer versus another. Was a Bellator-class dreadnought better than a Mandator? Sure, it was smaller, but the tech was more advanced. But which one was better? Would you like to know more? An amused voice asked, as my monitor expanded and engulfed me into a rather realistic 3D simulation. The ships looked menacing and ominous now, painted in a gray shade of militaristic might. Wouldn't black paint be more suited for deep space engagements? Hmm. Did my brother misplace some more LSD into my coffee? Last time he tried something like this, I had been chasing a virtual steam train for hours. Pretty train, although not really realistic. Ah, it's the ADD again. And you missed my reference. Pout. Did the LSD schizophrenia-induced voice reference mental disorders? Then again, Starship Troopers was another favorite of mine, since it featured starships and troopers. Pretty cool combination, if not really well written, or had any real strategy value. But, but cool. That's it, focus Peff, or I will enlighten you with lightning. The voice threatened me. Oh, a threat, or maybe a treat. Enlightenment by lightning, just like the Flash or maybe an Ascension thing like in Wuxia. Wouldn't it be nice though? Bazit, B-Z-Z-T-T-T-T-T. A flash of lightning sprang out of nowhere hitting me in the legs and producing an x-ray effect, my bones visible through clothes and flesh. And it hurt, quite a lot. I try to focus my eyes, and the voice now belongs to a face. George Lucas, I may be wasted, worse than I first thought. Ouch. Oh, www. Stop it! I yelled as the violet lightning shocked me to coherence and pain. This was strange. Did, did I fell asleep and was now lying unconscious in a pool of coffee? While my lamp was electrocuting me, LSD did seem to have quite some effects, right? Ever heard of random omnipotent bats? The fake George Lucas asks with a kind of voice. I think, while trying to collect my brains into the dustpan. Now pay attention. I have need for a champion and I chose you. Now, I don't want to wait for a new body to grow and learn the basics of Korska Galaxy. So you get to pick a species and force ability you will start with. You have an hour to pick wise. Can I have technopathy? Technopathy is pretty much the best force power. Some telekinesis would be great too. I interrupted the annoying Rob. Ever seen George Lucas get mad? I did. Technopathy. A bit of telekinesis. Sure. Rob replied. Voice a bit hesitant and maybe even confused. But also mocking and sarcastic. Thanks Rob. You're the best. I exclaimed happily. As the fake simulation around me collapsed into a single point and my mind was propelled at improbable speed through a hyperspace vortex. Hmm. I must have missed something. Why was the nice Rob mocking me? Anyways, pretty stars, galaxies and stars, quasars and black holes sped around me as I left my future behind. Or was it my past now? No matter. Look at those nebulae. So beautiful. Time travel and immeasurable distances traversed my consciousness to a galaxy far, far away in a long time ago. Omnipotent beings were such bullshit. In a galaxy far, far away in a long time ago, traveling backwards in time takes time confusing as it may seem. You need to be a doctor to understand it, so I won't bother. I think it took hours, at least. I was pretty bored by the time I reached my new body. However, I was now a foot-long force crystal, glowing green and buried under the ruins of Ruhr's space fortress, which itself was buried deep into the rocky world of Garn. So yeah, no more fun times for Peth. Unless rocks can have sex here in Star Wars, which wouldn't quite surprise me. They do make the improbable possible, every day. Still, I had four senses now, and I reached out with them, searching for signs of life or technology. Either would do. No luck. The planet was barren, the inhabitants long gone. A toxic yellow fog was rolling over dead trees, and a killer bioweapon fungus was creeping everywhere, making sure that any living thing that landed on this planet will soon be dead. Exploring more and more, stretching my new senses, I soon found some crystals named Soul Snares containing Force Spirits and some old Jedi armors. With old skeletons inside, 
I thought the Jedi cremated their dead. This was strange. Seems a war was fought here, destroying the planetary biome and the former inhabitants, along with their attackers. The Crystal Soul snares likely contained the spirits of the Jedi captured during the war. Or Sith, some scraps of old droids were lying closer, some cut to pieces, others just deactivated. Good enough, a safe place to learn my new force powers and build the start of an army. Why would I want an army though? I never wanted one before. Really strange. Bits and pieces of memories, probably from the former occupant of this crystal body, drifted through my mind. Precepts of the Ordu Aspect to, and their quest for eternal life. Their genocide at the hands of the Jedi Order. Lightsabers not hands, actually, elegant weapons and such. So sad, to have succeeded in their quest for immortality and be too dead to enjoy it. Or maybe not. Some of them may have ascended, and became one with the Force. Maybe, not likely, either way, the Ordu Aspect to were no longer around. Not on the material plane, and I was free to do as I liked as long as I remained undetected by the Jedi. Though, they will be gone soon as well, if they weren't all 66 ed already. I saw the movies, Planet Garn, Cadma Sector, Outer Rim, Year 25 BBY. Having no limbs is a pain. Then again, telekinesis and multitasking sort of compensate for something. I wish I could get angry at the sick entity who left me limbless and buried on some forgotten planet. Sadly, without an organic brain, I don't have real emotions. Stupid Jedi. There's no emotion. There's only peace. See how simple it was? Gah! I have begun reactivating some of the more intact droids and connected them to my own network. Did I mention I was an AI now? Not exactly though, as I was not mechanical and had senses beyond anything a computer could have. Still, there were partitions and various commands to implement, making running my body easier. If you encounter this story on Amazon, note that it's taken without permission from the author. Report it. My first task was to use a few of my guard droids to drag the remains of a dozen other droids and begin piecing myself a host for the crystal self. A few other guard droids were digging their way up and clearing the debris. Luckily the technology of this galaxy was extremely robust, years of neglect and disrepair not significantly impeding my progress into reinitializing the dozen droids around. However, I will have to look into obtaining a power source for them. And perhaps later, a spaceship. First thing, installing my crystal into the torso of a droid, then attaching intact limbs from the other droids around. To my shame, it took days to finalize my new body, since different droids required OS recombination and a bit of mechatronic art and creativity to fit together. Small steps, Puff. You have an invulnerable and ageless body now. Acquiring mobility and a veneer of social presence was useful, but not really necessary. I wasn't going to emulate Grievous anytime soon. I then began covering the droid chassis in a metal Jedi armor, which was quite impressive to look at, minus the horns. I'll have to get rid of those, sooner than later. Soon after, my honor guard also started wearing the Jedi armors, and I began training them, rehearsing social protocols, then combat algorithms. A month later, I looked over my domain, and despaired silently. A dozen ancient droids, wearing ancient Jedi armors and pretending to be bounty hunters. And failing badly. Hmm. I had these soul snares lying around. Maybe they could be put to some use. I delved into the force trying to establish contact with one of the spirits. But whoever was inside was quite mad. Possibly from solitude and sensory deprivation. I tried another and another, till I found a slightly saner one. Hey, is there anyone in there? I asked through a thin tendril of force bond. You monster. You aren't dead. An angry voice yelled at me. Who do you think I am? I wondered curious. We never met before. I was quite certain. You are Ruhr, the leader of Ordu Aspectu, the one who killed me and trapped me here. Hmm. My name may be short and sweet, but it wasn't Ruhr. Nope. Name is Pef, a mostly scraped droid with a crystal core. I replied instead, lifting the crystal snare up and rotating it to let it observe its surroundings. But... I can feel the resonance, it's the same as Ruhr had. Is this a strange joke? The Jedi spirit answered confused, as it did it with a question. A sense of humor the universe has. But if we are the joke, we have yet to see. I said wisely, pretty sure it was wise, just a few droids, and no life on the entire planet. We are still trapped, the spirit complained, its ghostly head floating inside the snare and looking around dejected. 
I handed the crystal to one of my mechanical guards, then started walking towards the tunnel leading to the surface. And then to my next destination. My scan range was quite large, since there were little disturbances on this dead planet. Sources of electricity? A cathedral ship, about 500 kilometers west, crashed here during the last days of Pius Dia Crusades. Excellent. It probably will be salvageable, but perhaps it had a subspace or hollow transmitter that could be repaired. And thus, I began the first step on the long march to building my empire. With a single step, Planet Garn, Cadma Sector, Outer Rim, Year 25 BB1, a thousand steps westward. First casualty of the long march, Droid Guard 485, TIE, GR also known as Mook Number 11 crashed, due to internal battery depletion. Oh, cruel fate, to be or not to be, the mystery of quantum physics. I proclaimed, holding the soul snare in my left droid hand, and looking at the defeated hero at my feet. I've been rescued by a madman. Air, insane droid, the Jedi and the crystal complained, possibly correctly, or maybe not. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. I continued my lament, kicking the useless depleted droid, just for kicks. Then I selected a single guard droid to escort me forward, leaving the decimal droids in a fallback position around our fallen. They were ten droids, so decimal. Clever, right? We leave no one behind. And if we do, it's for a good reason. I explained, continuing the march towards freedom. The spirit remained silent, possibly wisely. I was tempted to leave it behind as well, but lacking a skull to keep me company. A nearly dead and almost insane Jedi Padawan will do. I pushed forward, ignoring the lethal fog and the lethal fungus decorating the surface of the planet. Choosing a crystalline life form was proving to be quite an inspired choice, in hindsight. A body made of flesh would have died horribly the first minute its skin came in contact with this fungus. Some sort of bioweapon? From the anti huts crusades, most likely. Not that bioweapons were actually effective against adult huts. Their species were tinkering with bioweapons since the Celestials were still around. But perhaps the Crusaders wanted to exterminate a few young huts, caught outside their marsupial pouches. More steps, and more steps. If I was organic, I would have died of disease asphyxiation, thirst, hunger, and probably a few other things by now. It must be some force ability that sustains me and keeps my identity intact. Or an amused god in need of champion. Same thing in my mind. Still, a hundred hours later, marching continuously like a force-fueled droid that I was, I reached the cathedral warship. The god-emperor of mankind would have been proud of this vessel. I mused out loud, examining the remains from the outside, Paintings and sculptures, friezes and bas-reliefs, religious icons and humanity first. Monos. All used generously, along with gold and gemstones and depleted fissionable. Hmm, maybe the fissionable weren't depleted at the time they were last used. Craters made by X-ray pump lasers. Scorch marks of cesium-enriched nuclear warheads. Gallant weapons from more civilized times. Too bad they were long forgotten. Now people fought with swords. The sacrilege. Now, where would they have placed the Vox unit? I mean, the subspace transmitter. I sent my dear friend forward, and as expected, the ship's security protocols revived after 12,000 years of perfect inactivity, and blasted my droid guard to small bits, ignoring its fashionable Jedi armor, like tinfoil in a microwave. Just a walk in the park, I said in response to the cosmic joke. Maser beams, probably from the 34th Crusade. The spirit inside the soul snare explained, earning a commendation for the old Jedi teachings. He would be a master or even more, compared to the modern Jedi. I spread my senses, noticing a few solar-powered cells and their energized circuits, then gently infiltrated my technopathic tendrils and took over the remaining processors and data banks, sifting through millennia of astronavigation data. Huh, I found out where I am. Planet Garn, in Cadma Sector. Somewhat north of current hut space. Kind of suspected it. But now I was sure. Estimated galaxy time, plus three years of 22 BBY or the start of the Clone Wars, judging by galactic drift and old positional quasars. Damn, I hope I'm not too late. I wanted to take part in those wars. My anti systems and the cathedral ship finally meshed, and I found a working transmitter. Only subspace, though, seems Holonet appeared thousands of years after. Now, let's see planets in range. Thousands, but no one receiving. Here's one receiver. Gand, 
Hone the GAND species. Didn't they have these finders? I could use the GAND. Well, yes. Now, what to send and encourage a few to jump on a ship and come get me? What does everyone want? Riches and long life. Should work. Stranded explorer. Found ancient ship with ancient relics and life-prolonging medicine. Please send rescue on planet Garn. Look for big golden ship. Bring landing craft and salvage equipment. I sent and noticed a faint pulse in the force. Someone heard my call then. Great. Now, I had to prepare my welcome. Gand. Planet Garn. Cadma Sector. Outer Rim. Year 25 BB1. Cathedral Warship Crash Site. The remaining systems of the warship now under my control. I started preparing my surprise for the incoming rescuers. Maser weapons are much like lasers, only with radio or microwaves. Actually, never mind. They work completely different. Blue beams of kinetic energy that also carry thermal and electric charge. But planet side, they work great against most things, organic or not. You know, if you amplify certain sound frequencies, you can bring down buildings, shatter glass, or rupture organs. Now imagine a concentrated beam, or five, hitting something at once. Mook number 12 is looking down from droid heaven and shakes his head. It's sad, I know, but I'd rather keep my droid chassis. It had to be you, my friend. Crystalline life forms and artifacts, like kyber crystals and holocrons and soul snares. They were pretty much invulnerable to anything, though. They even survived the Death Star's beam after Alderaan was destroyed. And while some Force sects were able to upload their minds into computers and amulets and such, those objects were not indestructible by themselves. The only risk being a crystal posed was taking in too much energy and not releasing it for whatever reason. Because while immune to outside damage, from inside anything could be destroyed. I'll have to make a note of this and be careful not to eat an energy field bigger than my maximum capacity, whatever that was. Another maser reassembled on my shoulder, since I didn't actually need hands to aim and fire weapons. Gather some gems and gold plating, pile it down at my feet, and call the most charged droid to my location. Let's see, I could transmit the terrain map I recorded during my march, so it could spread towards me. In ten hours it will be here. Multitask and start assembling a few more maser beam weapons. The hull-mounted cannons would need reactor strength power levels, so not quite feasible. But anyway, disassemble one and bring it nearby, for research and intimidation purposes. Start dismantling the functioning solar cells and levitate them next to me as well. The maser beams will need power sources, just as my droid army. A few hours later, my work was complete, and I was bored again. What to do, till Mokash 7 reaches me? Oh, wait, I had a trapped soul in the soul snare in my hand. Now let's see, how did force drain work again? No idea but I had thousands of partitions to dedicate to the task. Force bond? No, that also works on Padawans, but this one is already dead. No point becoming his master. Aha, living force transfer, one directional. I knew all those Star Wars novels I read during university would come in handy sometime. Like now, and like electricity, the surge flows from positive to negative. Maybe, lightsaber forms, telekinesis practice, meditation, breathing techniques. Not really useful or applicable to my new species, but whatever. I was bored. Drain them all. What else? Space fighter combat. Small squad tactics. Demolition. Boarding operations. Planetary assault. Now we're talking, my young Padawan. Drain. What else? Religious and theological teachings. Self-flagellating philosophy. Years of those. Including basic Sith precepts as a boogeyman. Meh. I must be really bored. Give him here. History and galactography could be useful. The spirit-shaped man in the snare became translucent and dissipated, leaving behind a clear crystal. Vanished and gone. Ha! Huh. Take away his temple teachings, and he was nothing else. No individuality, no personality. And he left behind an empty cup. Pretty sad that his whole life was reduced to 20 years of studying. No friends, no family, and whatever personality he had was eroded in his millennia as a spirit. If he had any personality to begin with, lesson learned, I should acquire some friends and family, lest I share his fate. At least he was at peace now. His watch has ended. And now, my watch begins. Soon after I finished integrating the new memories and abilities from the long-dead Padawan, my guard droid arrived and loaded up with solar cells. Then he ran back to bring the rest of his buddies. What should I do till they return? 
collect more gems and gold, since this loot gonna provide me with funds to build new tech. Dismantle some old computers and droids, and a few repulsor lift units. Drag a few low caliber turrets down as well. Repair and combine them into a few hovercraft vehicles armed with a maser. My army is starting to multiply. Though manually assembling scraps of old tech and ruined code into workable designs is not very efficient. I need to figure a way to automate all this and become a force-powered commander. Do they even have nanite tech in this galaxy? Hmm. I did a quick search through my memories. Seems they did have some capabilities. From managing droid, nanodroids, and nanoviruses. Medical and bioweapon tech I sort of expected and didn't care much for just now. But those nanodroids sounded promising. I'll just have to spread my attention and obtain a sample. And if the other types were also technological in their nature, a few samples would be useful as well. From terraforming to genetic engineering and converting biomass into finished products, nanites could do anything. Rob wanted a champion, like I would punch and slice people with my limbs. I had a brain. Air. No, I didn't. I was a crystal. But I had a mind, and was an AI as well. Planet Garn, Cadma Sector, Outer Rim, Year 25 BB1. Cathedral Warship Crash Site. The space above the planet wavered and flashed, producing the signature of ship and a few living being on board. Only one Gand, the other's crew being Trandoshans, a Talorti, a Zabrok, and a bunch of droids. A Karelian frigate, possibly an Interceptor IV frigate model. Someone was gambling heavily on my rescue, but probably not. Most of these frigate types were used by pirates and slavers. And this being the outer rim, chances were my rescuers hoped to ventilate me and confiscate the riches for themselves. Just as planned. The ship did a full orbit of the planet, scanning for life signs and valuables probably, then began a rapid deceleration, using their particle shields to negate most friction and landed nearly on top of me, then rushed outside the ship, guns pointing in every direction. Air, textbook planetary assault, the Talordi wearing heavy armor and carrying dual blades, the rest covering him using blasters, bowcasters, even rocket launchers. I remained still my droid chassis lying on its back, and started hacking and integrating the other droids, in the ship, and the security systems. With every new technopathic hack my experience and skill double. At this rate I'll be able to control trillions of droids someday. Pretty good, right? And the rescuers? Well, they did not wear biohazard suits, for some reason. Why bother shooting them? They were already dead. Bioweapons man, the bane of every organic. The gand lasted longest, possibly because of his respirator. Sadly, I only had one snare, so I choose to catch the Talorti, since Gand would be plenty on their home planet, and Talorti were quite rare. This story has been stolen from Royal Road. If you read it on Amazon, please report it. Once all the life signs vanished, I rose and directed my droids, old and new, to start loading the cargo hold of my new ships with gold plates, and gems and the crew's weapons and armor and electronics. Form Zero was the best after all. If you had to fire a shot to win a fight, it was probably not worth the bother. Although, the Jedi Zero form involves holding the lightsaber and looking threatening, not waiting for your enemies to cough out their lungs. Bioweapons were kinda cheating though. Luckily enough, the Confederacy was probably already mass-producing droids, investing trillions of credits in my future army. Now I had a ship, two dozen droids, and the beginning of a plan. And while macers weren't the ultimate in weaponry, Laser having higher energy and thus better theoretical efficiency, unless the enemy had energy screens or were pretty much immune like the Vong. Microwaves were certain to blow up anything organic, by boiling them from inside out, while processors and data storage in droids would also be quite vulnerable. And due to having access to a new ship, I had some up-to-date maps and news. The year was 25 BBY. Well, not BBY since they wouldn't know yet that the Death Star was supposed to be destroyed in 25 years over Yavin. But after balancing a dozen official calendars, I decided to stick with the one on most Wikia. The Vong were most likely already invading the galaxy. By my memories they should have already reached Bimiel in the galactic north. Time to start forming my army and expand my empire. First a manufacturing base, then some ships and troopers, then be ready to intervene in the Clone Wars and capture Mon Calamari for myself. The squids built nice ships. First objective would be Gand, then the centrality and the sorcerers of Tund. Three years should be enough for an AI of my capabilities. Now, let's drain my new avian spirit and learn. Agelessness. Great, useless things again. 
I was an immortal crystal now, with no use for avoiding old age. Damn it. Two days later my ship arrived at the GAN system, featuring an almost livable planet called also GAN. Uh, ammonia atmosphere. Small steps path. At least this planet had life, unlike Garn. My new subjects went about their business and didn't offer my daily prayers yet. But soon, they will. The immortal emperor had arrived. Planet Gand, shadowless sector, outer rim. In orbit, aboard a space station, the planet had potential, despite the largely uninhabited land masses. Or better said, because of it, ammonia could be processed and transformed in various chemicals, like explosives and fertilizers. The atmosphere itself was proof of the universe playing jokes, pockets of breathable air, surrounded by large masses of ammonia. And in those pockets, many small tribes, forced to live in seclusion. I called a meeting with their ruling body, a despotic monarch, advised by a council made of powerful force sensitives, called Feinsman here. We met on one of the five orbital stations above the planet, and my droids started emptying my ship's hold, piling gold plates and gems. And kept piling, more and more. Those crusaders were quite obsessed with gold. An hour later, and a hundred trips too, the cargo bay was empty. The Gand were pretty amazed, as they watched the riches pilling up, and reaching the ceiling in the middle. I bring you riches, my friends. My signal is responded by your planet, and I always repay my debts. A thousand times more, I explained, gesturing at the pile of gold with my droid arm. The monarch hesitated between greed and cautiousness. Indeed, a ship left the station to respond to your hails. And it has indeed returned carrying riches, but no crew and no longevity medicine, he observed, remaining seated and imposing on his throne. Ah, but it did indeed bring long life. See, I notice your people's plight, your majesty, an atmosphere rich in ammonia, ready to be converted into fertilizers and explosives. And as the ammonia levels go down, more land could be used for farming. And the fertilizers will grow food even faster. Weapons are always in high demand. I explained, my four senses focused on his counsel. A slight change here and there. So, they did see it. The gold could sit useless in the monarch's treasury, or be used to better the life of the entire planet. The force spoke to them, showing them a potential future of richness and prosperity. Your gift is well received, droid. You may keep the ship, the monarch declared graciously, and signaled his guards to start stockpiling the new wealth in his treasury. And with that, I turned to leave, and the guards became burdened with gold plates and gems. His council members exchanged a short glance, and the force trembled again. A second later, a leadership change occurred, the monarch ahead shorter, and the council members leveling spears and pikes at the royal guard. I stopped and turned. Nobody sat on the throne anymore. It seems we need a new leader. What is your name, metal stranger? An older council member asked me, scrying me with the force. Well, the name is Pef. Short, sweet, rolls of the tongue. Ladies love it, I answered sketching a minimal bow. The organics stared at me, possibly confused. Do they? A young Gant Feinsman asked, possibly trying to reconcile my external aspect with my words. I sure hope so. Or it will be a waste of a sweet name, I answered amused, noticing a distinct lack of females in the council. Something to fix, as soon as they elected me emperor for life. How long would it take for our world to become a garden? Another Feinsman asked, ignoring my attempt at humor. That depends. Who is in charge? If he gets all the Feinsmen behind him and uses the wealth wisely. A wise Gand might do it in fifty years. It would take me at most five months, I answered, turning to leave. I didn't reach my ship. The younger Gand ran after me and passed me coming to a halt in front of me. This young one is named Zuckus. Zuckus had been tasked to bringing the graceful Pef back to the council. We have important news to share, he said politely. Okay, we can walk slowly though. I notice you're part of the ammonia breathers. Your biome will get replaced, if my plan comes through. I said softly. That did indeed sting him, making him halt for a fraction. Zuckus noticed. Zuckus believes deep canyons could be preserved, for those not willing to change. But a green world, it will be worth it, he replied, looking far away and pulsing in the force. Zucca sees far in the future then. The force is strong in him, I mused, as I reached the council chambers. The dream, you see it too, Pef, he wondered, almost surprised. 
I am part of the dream, Zuckus. The dream gave me life and power. And I carry the wind of change, I answered in a whisper. And maybe still too loud. The Feinsman had excellent senses. Part of the dream, Pef says. What does the council say? Is this Pef a Gand in all but flesh? The oldest Gand asked rhetorically. I, the other Feinsman replied with ceremony. A year, if you will, Metal Gand. Lead us and show us your dream made real. Where do we start, honored leader? The old Gand asked, now back to a polite tone, and gesturing slightly towards the throne. It was still slick with blood. Right, we need to buy a hundred ships, go anti cruiser or such, and send Feinsmen on quests to obtain nanotechnology samples. And keep buying ships, no matter how old or damaged. We will repair them and use them to sell fertilizer and explosives. I know I said five months, but if we work a little harder, we can be done in three months, I proclaimed, already expanding my senses and taking over all the systems on the space station. My first planet, conquered with a dream and a few words. Form Zero was truly too powerful. Now I had to learn the Gand language and customs, and be prepared for the inevitable resentment. And start making friends. The ladies will have to wait though. New Hope, Planet Gand, Outer Rim, lording above my new subjects. Aboard Celestial Throne. Two weeks later, ah, uh, I knew the huts will be useful. My closest neighbors and new trade partners. The hoarding slugs love gold and gemstones too much. And they have quite nice toys to sell as well. They kind of are the black market, at least in this sector of the galaxy. Zuckus and my frigate was sent to buy goods with gold and gemstones and returned with samples of dozens of nanoplagues and scraped models of droids from a hundred different manufacturers. I reserved a section of the Imperial Station for my biotech division and instituted quarantine and bioweapons protocols on that deck. Another space station was designated as Ship Repair and Admiralty Headquarters. A hundred old ships are being dismantled and refitted, mostly freighters and haulers. The other three stations I started to expand, adding more docks for future trade. Planning ahead, the bioagents I have now aren't very useful, having been programmed just to kill and having little extra functions. But they are good for learning and experimenting. A full partition of my AI mind is now working on reverse engineering these bioweapons into terraforming agents. Another partition is working on the droids, sifting code and hidden programming bugs in backdoors. A dozen Feinsmen are still deployed westward, trying to find the provider for those nanodroids. Salukami was the most powerful trade center nearby, and another target for my empire's expansion, once the wars began. And since the trade union was starting to take over the planet just now, my window was closing fast. I had to acquire hollow transmitters and begin decrypting Republic transmissions. Luckily, my agents were officials of my government, thus allowed to purchase a hollow node and a wide band frequency for our planet's expanding trade and commerce. No news of nanodroids yet. Perhaps the research is still ongoing, in some hidden trade union lab. And also, the first obstacles in the local fronts. Gand were slavers, and even more, use their gifts to find fugitive slaves. Stupid organics. They wouldn't run a revolt if you paid them. And thus, I decreed that all slaves in the PEF Empire will become imperial servants and be replaced with droids where their labor was deemed important, like farming or mining. A new partition in my mind, delegated to manage the former slaves and begin educating and training them as imperial officials and administrators. I kept a few nicer-looking Twi'leks and other humanoids as protocol and entourage, much in the vein of the huts. Only with perks and hints of authority. My visit among the slave compounds did reveal a few perks, like a self-imposed slave leader, looking after them and trying to keep them alive and fed. A green Twi'lek former dancer, with a heart of gold. I kinda need one for myself, to have some perspective. Dora, my dear, as first made to the imperial throne, you will speak with my voice. You will have billions of credits to spend as you wish. So stop complaining and study harder. I explained to my newest addition, a bit amused at her doe eyes. Can I buy myself a necklace? With pearls? The green-skinned dancer asked with a cute pout. Sigh, now I kind of miss having certain glands. See that huge pile of gold and gemstones? Pick whatever you want and wear them. Just, I trailed as the girl dropped her pad and ran to the pile and began loading herself up with a dozen kilograms of metal and rock. Cause really, gold and diamonds? They're too heavy. She complained after failing to move back, dropping the loot and keeping a single diamond, maybe egg size. Finish the trade routes chart in the galactic history course, 
and I'll give you a droid to carry some gold for you. I told her with a fake, sad sigh. She began reading from her datapad again. Huh, I hope this will work. Stupid organics, so proud of carrying rocks around their necks, when they could wield real power with a swipe of a finger on their datapads. Then again, I am a rock now, so what do I know? Huh, minor alchemy success in my bio labs. First ammonia, nitrogen explosive was complete. The testing chamber wasn't damaged by the explosion at all. Eh, small steps, Puff. Concussion class explosives may take more work to achieve. Droid recombination protocols still wouldn't mesh. Too many proprietary codes. But they'll work, someday. A gammed woman approached the throne and looked at my maid with slight disgust. Not that you could see it on her insect-like face, but I have the force, so yeah. Great leader, this one is named Zurli. Zurli wonders why she's not down on the planet, tending her animals. She asked politely, slightly confused. Zurli, you are now the Emperor's hand. Take the blue data pad and start learning Galactic Basic. I will need you to represent me on the council. I clicked and hissed back at her, pointing at the data pad I programmed for her instruction. Gan sounds strange and requires hand gestures to be fully fluent. Then again, I'm not an insect, so why do I care? A female on the council. What insanity is this? She grumbled and complained, sitting next to my maid and starting to learn the Orbesh and new words. Eh, I told them I bring the wind of change. Gan will never be the same. Another partition in my AI mind using the force to implant my servants with vocabulary and concepts, accelerating their learning speed a thousand times. Cheating, right? Memory modification has quite a lot of potential applications, so I'll have to explore this ability in depth. Changing how a society works will not be easy. Already the more traditional GANs were chaffing at the new rules. Since buying new slaves became counterproductive, only adding to my imperial servants. The new weapons and machinery I sent to the planet helped though. Droids will work harder and without rest or food. And beating and whipping droids would just tire their master. Some Gans were a bit of sadists. Learn to cope. For now. You'll have the chance to deal pain to others soon. I made a note to mark those more aggressive for my Black Ops division. And on the other partitions, I was running intelligence and counterintelligence actions all over the sector, guiding droids to infiltrate the centrality in their networks. Finding spies and infiltrators from the huts and the Trade Federation and even the Galactic Republic. Those that could be turned, with bribes or blackmail I'll keep, the others made to disappear. Contact toxins and other bioweapons were quite useful now. We can sell ammonia to the Mon Calamari. Dora spoke, somewhat intrigued that someone would need the toxic gas for anything. Ah, uh, yes. Water world, they would need ammonia for cooling and other things. Like explosives. Unauthorized reproduction. This story has been taken without approval. Report sightings. See, your first trade route, my maid. You will earn half a percent of the profits. If you make any, I told her amused, as she began typing furiously on her pad, calculating fuel costs and profit margins. About a thousand credits per ship. That's fifty credits. I could make the same by dancing one evening, Dora complained. Still not satisfied. So, sell a thousand shiploads. Every month would be a better income then. I mused out loud, while subtly highlighting possible buyers and trade routes on her pad. My Twi'lek maid began computing new trades routes on her pad, exclaiming happily as one or another appeared more profitable. Ah, the joy of becoming rich. Another success in the biotech division, separating ammonia into water and other gases, like hydrogen and nitrogen. Ah, fuel for fusion plants then. Energy costs will drop if I don't have to import energy. Another partition, energy department. First task, hydrogen fuel cells along with solar power cell reverse engineering. The crusaders won't bother me with patent litigation, having been gone for a dozen millennia. Hmm, Mazer tech as well. Mostly nobody used it anymore, except perhaps the Chiss ascendancy on the other side of the galaxy. And heavy Mazer cannons didn't need to bond a gas for supercharging, only better hypermatter reactors, or more of them. New partition, send a holler back to Garn, droid crew only. Salvage some working guns from the cathedral warship, and bring the soul snares as well. Might need to drain those soul containers and fill them up with Gan defectors or ton sorcerers. New force abilities were always welcome. Planet Gan, Outer Rim. A month after becoming Emperor, Council Chambers, the Golden Throne was a nice touch, being actually made of starship gold plates, and decorated with gems. 
probably not really comfortable to sit on, if I was still an organic. At least it wasn't a wooden throne, still steaming with warm blood. My first council meeting was quite radical. My council had the back of their seats also plated with gold, to point out the newly acquired riches and importance. But on my left and right, I had my hands, their seats decorated with a pole carrying a golden hand. And on their chest, a tiny hand containing access codes to the Empire's network. That was their purpose and real power. Zuckus and Zerli, hands of the Emperor, Dora was sitting on a comfy pillow at my feet, recording the Council's proceedings on her datapad. First made to the Emperor, and once her training was finished, she will have a kyber crystal pinned to her chest, and become my voice. Esteemed counselors, honored hands, and adored maids, we can begin, I proclaimed, gesturing dramatically with my droid's arm, and opened up the huge hologram depicting the Empire and our achievements. Security, commerce and profits, findsmen and their trainees, and lastly the dream. The terraforming project. Man, I was ripping off Dune like a boss. But if it works, Zuckus will explain the security aspects first. We have purchased 143 spaceships of various classes, including one more frigate and 23 corvettes. They are being upgraded as we speak, with 20 concussion missile launchers each. The new defense fleet should be enough to protect our shipping from pirates for the next two months. The other ships form the transport fleet in the Black Ops Division. Zuckus began, producing various schematics for the warships and their ongoing upgrades. I motioned him to skip over intelligence reports then looked at my other hand. Zerli looked at me hesitantly, then began explaining the commerce aspects, in basic. And man, weren't the councilmen surprised? Two weeks to become fluent in galactic basic must have been a shock. And a female to boot, empire commerce and profits have increased by a thousandfold in the past month. It appears that selling ammonia and exploration services to various corporations and universities can be highly profitable. The profits have been reinvested in more ships and equipment, but soon the esteemed finesmen will need to delegate more of their trained diviners for the exploration corps. Every minor hyper-trade route that we discover will mean billions of credits to our budget. Our empire has expanded to three new systems, and the empire has claimed them as exclusive economic zones. One ship has been lost to pirates, but the droid's pilots initiated self-destruct and took a pirate ship down as well. This humble one hopes more navy ships will be directed to protect our commerce, Zerli said, and appeared both exalted and terrified of speaking to the council. Chief Feinsman, if you would, I added softly, gesturing towards the eldest Gan. Yes, well, the new teaching that the Emperor has gracefully provided did increase the success rate of our Feinsman. Mental disorders have also subsided in both intensity and rate of occurrence. Meditation techniques do seem to work, however, only six of our hunt packs have listened to our summons and returned home to Gand. Mujilik estimates at least a thousand and possibly two thousand Feinsmen are still roaming the galaxy and have yet to hear our call. This one hope the Emperor isn't displeased. Change is harder for us, as he already knows, Mujilik spoke softly, with a faint aura of grief and sadness. The Emperor doesn't blame you personally, Mujilik. The training I provide will work, both mentally and physically. Give it time, and learn. You are only 84 years old, and you could live to be 500 or even more. A teenager you are, truly. Trust in me who trusts in you, and the dream will happen. Have faith in your emperor, and blame me if the teachings I bring you are wasteful, 500 years from now. I replied, observing the Gand going through shock, then doubt, and lastly hope in his aura. This rash teenager apologizes, esteemed emperor. We shall discuss my failings in a hundred years. Mujilik responded with a faint humor in his aura. Still doubting me, even as the force reinforcement I implanted him with work to repair and reinvigorate his body. Now, it's my turn. The dream, I proclaimed, changing the hollow projections to the biotech discoveries and adaptations. The samples your emperor had to work with are still limited and highly restricted. Mostly to killing organics, but I have managed to obtain partial results. Ammonia derivatives and hydrogen extraction. Coupled with ammonia exports and factories being established planetside, I estimate one more month till I can mass produce a biospore to evaporate ammonia above 1,000 meters altitude. The third month will be critical, as the safety of our people will become the prime concern. Ammonia breathers should prepare to relocate in the Karuk canyons once the oxygen nitrogen levels balance out at sea level altitudes. We will discuss that move at the next council, 
I explained, producing a hollow of the planet and projecting the ammonia levels decreasing. The Gand looked at the projection with wonder and hope. The dream of thousands of generations becoming real in their lifetimes. A green world. Oh, if only they knew. Garden worlds were prime targets for invasions and colonization. Their safety was about to expire. And then, they will have to defend their new world for the next thousand generations. A reason to keep training and manning the fleets in the army. And support their immortal emperor till the end of time. Terraforming. Planet Gand. Outer Rim. 25 BBY. The Spanish had conquered the Amerindians with ease, due to their advanced tactics, armor, and weapons. But the tech levels were only a thousand years in advance. My ships and contact crews have at least 30,000 years of technological advancement compared to most species in the sector. I don't expect to need more than a few years to create a pocket empire around Gand. What I need the most is my own force sensitive group. The Feinsmen are nice, but not enough. I thought and sifted through my memories now greatly augmented by the force and my crystalline nature, along with the AI subroutines. At least fifty known force-sensitive sects and cults, with the Altesian Jedi and the Falanasi being my prime recruits. And while the Altesians would be harder to locate, with them roaming the galaxy aboard a cruiser-slash-school, the Falanasi would be much easier. Their hiding place wasn't that far either. Dora, stand straight, and hold this crystal in your right hand. I demanded from my green twilight maid. Yes, my emperor, she said and complied. I will reveal my nature, my true self to you. With this, you become my voice in the galaxy. The promises you make, the threats you make, the debts you take, they will be mine. And if you feel doubt or are uncertain, hold the crystal tight and think about me. I will hear you and respond. And when you die, rest certain. Your soul will stay by my side, save for eternity, I proclaimed opening the droid's chest and floating out in my green crystal form. Uh, you're not a crazy droid after all. Dora whispered, as I began aligning her soul with the kyber crystal. No, my adored maid. This is the greatest secret in the Empire, and only my voices get to experience it, I replied telepathically. So, what do I do now? The maid asked, her aura fluctuating between adoration and terror. Repeat after me, for it is in passing that we achieve immortality. Infinite in distance and unbound by death, I release your soul, and by my shoulder protect thee. The Force has set me free, I whispered in her mind, balancing the crystal to align with her own feeble aura. The crystal in her hand glowed brightly, and settled on the same green hue as my own glow. A Force bond, and a conduit for a soul snare. Should she die, her soul will indeed stay by my side, for eternity. I can feel you now, my Emperor. I will never doubt you again, Dora said crisply, pinning the crystal to her chest. Eh, don't take it all so serious. It's just immortality. Now, take my frigate, a hundred droids and a few finesmen, and go to planet Lukazek. Find a Falanasi woman named Wailu, and invite her and the rest of her group to join us. Take some gold and gems too, along with a few million credits. And tell Wailu that she can have her own planet in my empire for their loyalty and cooperation against the great evil that's coming. Whatever her response, gift her the gold. I told my maid, while floating back inside my droid, how do I take the ship and the Feinsman? They won't listen to me, Dora asked, hesitantly. You speak with my voice, Dora. They'll listen, I said amused, poking a droid finger at her chest. The kyber crystal was still glowing green. The droids already received her scan as my second in command. Ah, uh, I carry a part of you with me. Sorry. My emperor, still doubting you, she replied respectfully. Enough of that, we're both immortal beings now. Now give me a hug and go, I demanded petulantly. She hugged the chassis with a mix of awe and adoration in her aura. Eh, we'll do for now. I'll need to experiment with human clones and memory transfer soon. Can't have my maid be not satisfied. Can I? As Dora left, I inspected the other partitions in their work, then began looking for my next maid. An emperor had to have more than one maid after all. And maids will need to be of more diverse races, to show the galaxy we're not a xenophobic empire. Hmm, what to call my beautiful not wives? Honored matres or honored maids? Maids sounded sexier though. Matres were a matriarchal societies in Dune. I'll have to think of a badge of office, or a uniform though. Hmm, maids did come with a uniform though. Let's see. Short dark blue skirts and a white tiny apron? Would work, for work inside the palace. For delegations and such, 
dark blue robes with a white sash. Damn, I quite miss an organic body now, and my glands. Planet Gand, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. Second month since becoming Emperor. I have three new maids, lazing on fluffy pillows beneath the golden throne, and wearing skimpy skirts. And we'll need a new counselor, since one Gand decided that my policies regarding confiscating the slaves and promoting females on the council was somehow disrespectful to tradition. He produced a Gand discharger and tried to end my dynasty. Only his fingers couldn't find traction to pull the trigger. Telekinesis is such a cheat. Plus, he kind of planned the whole thing for a week. Enough time to prepare a soul snare for him. The dream cannot be stopped by mortal weapons. Did you think you could kill the immortal emperor? I proclaimed, levitating the crystal snare and touching it to his head. His screams might have terrified the council a little, but possibly even more. The finesman sensing his soul being sucked inside the snare. His mortal coil fell towards the golden floor, in slow motion, while his weapon and the snare floated towards my throne. Now let's see. Divination trance. Genetic altar. Pathfinding through mists. Tracing a force marker. Discerning unstable hyperjumps. Hiding in shadows. Seeing from shadows. Meditation. Breathing techniques. His soul evaporated, leaving me with all his force abilities. Beside what he had learned from the teaching crystal that the finesman received from me, all the techniques were unknown to me. Now I was a true Gand. In ability as well. His soul will rest with the ancestors. Now, let's continue the council. Zuckus, if you would, I continued softly, as my droids came to take the body away, and the hologram grew to engulf the whole room. Ah, uh, yes, security-wise, the defense fleet has ten corvettes and forty-four smaller warships patrolling the routes our shipping takes. Our MC-30 frigate will become operational next week. By next month we should have thirteen more corvettes refitted for anti-piracy work. We have purchased an MC-40 light cruiser that was damaged during trials and slatted for scrap, and have begun refitting it, however, it will lack heavy weapons for next year. Nineteen more corvettes have also been purchased and will begin their refit as soon as the dock space is free. For now, they exist as a fleet in being, guarding our planet. We are training more crews and drilling along with the droids for boarding operations and planetary assaults. Eighteen starfighters have been lost while trying to find a secret route to the centrality. Two fighters have survived, but didn't return. We suspect they did indeed reach the centrality, and have gone dark, awaiting rescue or refueling. The bounty hunters that have returned to make excellent teachers for the new recruits, Zucka said softly, his mind slightly more balanced now. The Feinsman education about the Force was kind of flawed and full of tradition, but it mostly worked. Except the lack of breathing and lungs had denied them the opportunity to practice meditation techniques based on controlled breaths. Which in turn gave way to mental problems, from fractured minds, to various visual and oral hallucinations, that they called the dream. Which often featured a verdant planet, which I suspect was the force reacting to their deepest desires. I'll make their dreams true, once I had a large enough fleet. Forty Corvettes was a pitiful fleet, but better than nothing. I still haven't found any news of nanodroids, but the tech from the Mon Calamari frigate and cruiser could be reverse engineered to provide all our ships with better engines and shields. My left hand, Zerli changed the hollow projection for the next segment, without waiting for my prompt. She could learn then, commerce-wise, the empire is still growing. Ship maintenance and ordnance purchase, along with cost of lost starfighters, have increased dramatically. We have still doubled our exports and increased our profits by a third. This expansion is not sustainable though. By next three months we will need new revenue sources, or we will stall. The market for the Exploration Corps is not infinite, and ancient ruins are not profitable in the short term. Especially not if we provoke the Jedi Order. We should open up one of the new planets for mining, Zerli believes, the female Gand argued, projecting graphs that predicted our income going negative in three months. Councilman Mujilik? Something to add? I asked politely, ERRM. Yes. My knees have stopped hurting. If it's a sign of the life-prolonging teachings or myself going dull in my old age, remains to be seen. Feinsman wise, the next trials will take place next month, and possibly provide the Empire with a hundred new explorers. Our females are also working hard to produce more younglings, as you have required, my Emperor. If you spot this story on Amazon, know that it has been stolen. Report the violation. So far, they seem happy about it. Twenty-one Feinsmen have died past two months, 
20 of them in exploration duties, while one. Due to critical thinking failure, however, 23 Feinsmen have returned, so our numbers have grown a little. The promise of becoming a ship captain and choosing three females have encouraged them, and I have signals that the dream will attract even more. Mujilik replied calmly, his eyes lingering for a second at the spot where his fellow Gant died. All right, honored councilmen, hands and maids, as you have seen, my experiment with giving my maids my voice has succeeded. Once the crystal is green, they are my voice, and I expect them to be obeyed in every word or action. The empire will grow, and soon we will spread across dozens or hundreds of stars. I will rule through my voices and my hands. The imperial servants will provide the bulk of our administrata once their training is complete. Organization-wise, the third hand will direct black operations of the empire, its identity known only to myself and my hands. The third hand's budget will not be scrutinized unless a hand or myself deems it necessary. This is for everyone's protection. The galaxy has mind readers, telepaths, and other forms of discerning hidden operations, including Sith, Jedi, and worse. Also, once the dream is finished, I will begin the Avatar project to grant me an organic interface. This project may take up to three years and will be funded from my own budget. Now, about the dream. The newest nanophage acquisitions from the huts, especially the deforestation agent, have provided the critical clue in devising a safe mode to terraform Gan. The poles will remain imperial exclusion zones for as long as the danger remains. Explosives are quite dangerous, I explained. Going over each subject I thought they needed to know. Gigatons of explosives resulting from converting the ammonia in the atmosphere were beyond dangerous. I just hoped burying them deep under the poles would keep them safe. Then again, I chose to make binary explosives, so each agent will be separated by the largest possible distance. I was more worried about some terrorist group appearing and detonating megatons of fertilizers. Those had to be kept ready and available for exports and farming. Maybe smaller containers? and spread apart even more? A bad finesman will find them anyway. I was even more interested in the GAN Discharger, which appeared to be a nerve disruptor weapon of sorts, able to stun, paralyze, or outright kill any organic. Some kind of nerve overload, working at very low frequencies. Infrasound, most likely. Emperor Peff, a vocoder voice, disturbed this partition. Yes, councilman. I replied without a hint of emotion. I have a daughter, and she appears to want to become a finesman. She also wants her own ship. The Feinsman asked, somewhat scared and hopeful. Okay. And, I wondered back, it's against tradition, but, if Zorli can do it, we will soon have a hundred races and genders on the council. Better prepare her soon. I'll keep the council seat empty till the next Feinsman trials, I replied, turning the knob a little more. The Gan shook his head and left, leaving me basking in the adoration of my new maids. Peff, can I have a ship too? Selene, the blonde maid asked hesitantly. Thinking of running away already? Sure you can, if you learn all the lessons on your pad and become my voice. Before you go, sing something, will you? I demanded, amazed at the quality of her voice. Back home, she would be a superstar. Planet Gand, Pef Empire, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. Another week passed, while I devoted three-fourths of my partitions to the terraforming nanophages below. I was too afraid to try alchemical transmutation on planetary scale, no matter the degree of precision and multitasking my telekinesis power had. One single error, and the planet would vanish in a cataclysmic explosion. So, I just upgraded the self-reproductive codes for the nanophages, selected atmospheric ammonia as their target, and just struggled to keep them under control. Every millisecond or so, a neutrino or something would hit one of them, changing their code and causing unexpected mutations, some directed to other gases, while others rebooted them to their factory default, which was multiply and kill all organics. It was a wonder that the galaxy still had life, with all the plagues and bioweapons lying around from thousands of wars before. A few corvettes were drilling huge caves deep under the poles, using low-yield turbo lasers as drills. And my voice was returning, her ship carrying two force sensitives more than she left with. Guess she did find someone then. Never mind the maid, focus on the terraforming, Pef. I did use telekinesis with the other partitions, mostly to separate fertilizer particles from breathable air and compact them into bricks. Then lay the bricks in huge pyramids. I was pretty damn hard work. And I wasn't even paid. Oh well, I should give myself a bonus then. Focus, Pef. Don't let the crazy phages eat our subjects. 
Should I sing more, my emperor? Selene asked, with a raspy voice. Damn it. Her whole lungs were on fire. She pushed through the pain and kept singing. No, Selene. I said a few songs. That means three or four songs. Not ours. Get some rest and come back tomorrow, okay? I said softly, pulsing a tendril of force healing into her. Damn slaves. Used to be beaten or worse for any slight. Still terrified of any male. She wasn't ready to be a voice. Lyra. Go take care of her. Use a Bakta tank if the doctor says it will help. I told my other maid. Sure think that. Just tell a few droids to escort me. I have no voice, after all, Lyra replied. Hints of excitement in her aura. Ah, she gets to order people around. Finds it amusing. She will do just fine with a voice. Two justice droids fell from the ceiling at her sides, using repulsor beams to land silently. This way, honored maid, one of them said, gesturing towards the door. Thanks, Pef, you're the best, Lyra exclaimed hoping to her feet and running after Selene. She'll do just fine. Anyway, focus path. Terraforming for now. Another brick. And another brick. Brick by boring brick. Trillions of bricks of fertilizer. Juggled at once. If only my mother would see me now. Focus path. Don't kill your subjects with your ADD. Right. The caverns should be deep enough now. Ammonia should cool them pretty fast. Then we stop making fertilizer and start making explosives. My brother would be so proud now. I wonder if just one end would take fire. Would the planet take off like a rocket? Focus, Peth. Just a few more trillion bricks. Who came up with this plan? Oh, drawing too hard on the force. I felt gazes turning towards my little corner. Hide in shadows. Shush. There. Didn't see me. More bricks, but slower. Small steps, Peth. And, surprise, another mutation in my nanogene terraformers. Dissolve metal? That's a useful mutation. For a change. I'll keep that strain and lift it up. Now, let's see about cleaning the low orbit of metal debris from millennia of space accidents and pirate actions. Look, a metal bolt. Let's latch to it and reproduce. Eat up and grow stronger little phage. And maybe one day, this strain will mutate again and get me even better abilities. For now, I will store the new metal-eating phage somewhere safe, like a glass bottle. Do I have to stay here and listen to you? Ramble crazy stuff? My third maid. A blue twilight girl asked with boredom and carelessness in her aura and voice. Hmm, might have spoken aloud, for a while. Now, this girl was not supposed to be here, in this timeline. I suspect some kind of divine intervention. I don't mind though, she keeps entertaining me in many ways. No, vet, go do whatever, I said, still amused. All right then, I'll go watch cool holotubers rant about cool weapons and ships, and then shoot myself before you blow all of us up. Vet declared with even more boredom and ennui. Or, you can take a few droids and a findsman and go explore. Find Planet Dween, chat with the locals, buy a few cool weapons. I baited her. Bitches love guns, this bitch in particular. Or, I can do that. I get to be the captain? She perked up at once. No, my honored maid. The findsman captain will leave the ship. But you get to spend my money. I replied, launching my hook. Eh. I will buy the most expensive armor and pistols. Cuz, you're a rich bastard. And a rocket launcher. CYA later, Peth. Vet said, waving her hand dismissively, then patting the justice droid who landed next to her. Metal boy, you have to do what I say, right? The twilight asked aloud, as she left the throne room. Yes, honored maid, the droid replied politely. Great, let's hunt some pirates. Some slavers too. Criffing scumbags. Vet proclaimed punching the droid in the shoulder and regretting it instantly. Don't punch droids, as you say, honored maid. I replied through my droid, and faked rubbing my hurt shoulder. She was fun, and I had to test the new Mazer guns of the MC-30C frigate anyway. Nothing like a few pirates for target practice. Focus, Peth. Those bricks won't lay by themselves. Damn bricks. Gand Emperor. Planet Gand. Peth Empire. Outer Rim. 25 BBY. My surviving explorers have just returned from the centrality, with two new hyperroots, uncharted before. One of them is immediately put to use, linking Gand to Ocean and tripling our commerce overnight. The other route links Gand with Tund and will become important later. And the core found a few routes to a couple nearby stars, though without life-bearing planets. Then again, it's a big galaxy, a trillion stars and about 50 millions habitable planets. And with the force messing around, most of those planets have already been discovered or had sapient species evolve. 
we only have one other planet with trees and such, breathable atmosphere and all. And its Finesman Finder is now leading the Black Ops, as my third hand. That planet will stay secret, to be populated with Force Sensitives in the future. My new hand received ten females that I vetted to have Force Sensitivity, and relocated his base of operation on the new planet. And probably enjoying his harem, the lucky bastard. But anyway, he deserves it. A secret planet is worth a lot. Especially if you want to create a new force group, hidden from everyone else. And he came up with the three female trick for the returning Feinsman, which also helped. And it appears most of the returning Gans came for the females and not for the ship I bought for them. I'll have to start planning their birth rates though, since being partly insects, the Gan tended to lay tons of eggs. Being limited by their small villages by the ammonia clouds, they tended to be quite spartan till now, crushing any single not perfect egg. But who knows, in the future they may become trillions, and the dream become a nightmare. Emperor, your voice has returned, Celine said softly, nodding towards the door. Yeah, I kind of felt her from thousands of light years away. The older woman with silver hair was likely Wyalu. The male wasn't someone I recognized, and looked almost Persian by skin tone. Do I get a hug? I asked Dora, and she rushed in my droid's arms. My other maids stared at us confused. Don't worry, you'll figure it out later. Hey, Pef, I felt you strain while coming back. You are right, Dora whispered. Had a lot to do. And not enough hands, I replied, telepathically. Wailu raised an eyebrow, possibly detecting my sending. The woman was a mystery, her mind cloaked in a thick layer of white mist. I could sense nothing from her. The man, uh, one of the rare male Falanasi. Not fully trained yet, he was weirded out and somewhat scared. Esteemed colleague. Please sit. Maids go back and study. Take the boy with you. I spoke at once, stepping off my throne and floating on a pillow at the base. I patted the pillow next to me and the woman smiled. All right, go tip on you. You came to see the galaxy after all. Don't mind me. Wailu spoke crisply, and the man ran after my maids. I want to stay as well, Dora said, a bit hesitant. You're the voice, Dora. You can do whatever you like, I answered warmly and watched her sit beside me and hug me with one arm. You're a strange droid path. Like those Iron Knights I heard of? Wailu asked gently, gesturing at my justice droids. No, I am human, just like you. Only immortal, I answered, opening my chest and revealing my naked crystal. Damn woman examined me deeply, and I almost wished I wore underwear on my crystalline shape. A force imprint, and so powerful, she whispered after a long time. The force trembled slightly, as it always did when something important changed. Yes, it uses the precepts of Ordu Aspecto. And even better, if you need a human body, you can grow one and copy yourself on its mind. This will be my next project, once Ganda's finished terraforming, I explained, starting the hologram of the planet, and the ongoing terraforming. A week or two, and the ammonia will be gone, except in a few deep canyons. Ordu Aspecto. They vanished millennia ago. Exterminated by the Jedi, she said, with a slight revulsion in her voice. Great, we think alike. Well then, it's time for the Jedi to end, I answered, offering my droid hand to shake on. The woman smiled. I'll need a voice, she answered, shaking my metal hand. I'll have to make you younger then. I bet you looked fabulous in your youth, I told her, baiting the pond. Tell me more, she said with a short laugh. Tomorrow, I bet you girls are tired from the trip. Go test my jacuzzi, and I'll see you for dinner, I told both of them, lifting them up along with their pillows and guiding them towards my apartment. Wailu tested my telekinetic grip with some wonder, before sighing and sending a telepathic message. And I want everything, you know, damn Jedi, hiding everything, she complained. Wait till I drain some Sith then. I don't even have half. Huh, you're not a Sith, Wailu wondered, possibly assuming any non-Jedi was a dark Jedi. The Sith are just crazy Jedi. I explained as I dropped both of them in the warm jacuzzi tub. Come join us, Pef, Dora yelled from the tub. Hmm. The droid chassis hosting my crystal would fry in water. But I could go naked. They both saw me nude already. Planet Gand, Pef Empire, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. Third month since becoming Emperor. In one hour the most important council will start. I have two voices now. Dora, the green Twi'lek and Lyra, a Togruta with red skin and racial white marks. Lyra had her own special trait, her force aura infused with kindness. 
which made her easy to talk to. She was also quite smart and had a way with words, disarming conflict with the right words. Lyra did it to keep peace in her former slave compound, but I suspected it would work great even at largest scale. I selected my maids to have at least a smudge of force sensitivity, or the kyber crystal wouldn't bond. Dora has co-opted the other maids into changing my appearance. They're planning to install me in a protocol chassis, and paint it gold. What's wrong with this chassis? Okay, it might be a dozen millennia old, and looks creepy. Guess I do need to look dressed as an emperor. But 3PO? No way. Wyalu has returned to her planet, aboard our newly repaired cruiser and escorted by a frigate and two corvettes. When she returns, her order will be deposited in secrecy on the sanctuary. A shipment of pit droids and other construction-capable series has already landed and began constructing a spaceport and housing. Organics need so many things just to survive. Keeping them alive and happy will be a pain. They also have families and kids. More joy, I hope they will fit in one cruiser. Then again, hundreds of force-trained people. Once they learn most everything I know, they will be pretty strong. But that will take years. The Gand Finesmen have become pretty effective and stopped dying so much. Takes so much time to grow and train a new one, or maybe the weakest ones died already. That would be ideal. A few of the most, let's say reputed bounty hunters that returned, did so for the dream, once they heard the planet was becoming green. Had to force myself to encourage grass and algae to grow like mad, just to make the planet appear green from orbit. Crops and trees will take much longer to grow, but at least, I have now enough explosives to manufacture trillions of missiles. No more importing explosive ordnance, self-made missiles are the future. Emperor, we are ready to begin, Dora said with a slight cough. Right, enough musings, honored council, hands, voices and maid, I will reverse the order of business, as you probably want to hear about the dream first. Gand is green, my mandate is over, please decide now if I kept my word. Waiting a whole year to be kicked out from my job would suck. Sadly, we cannot let you go, Emperor Pat. This humble one would like to scold you a hundred years from now as well. And myself being able to make my new female happy has nothing to do with it, at all. Must be the teenage hormones. The elder Mujilik said politely, and sipped a gulp of super expensive Corellian brandy. His kidneys began working again then. I moved my head from one council member to another, and stared at the newest additions. A female finds a woman, and a grizzled mercenary who claimed he never abandoned his councilman post, just took a vacation for 55 years. I heard you are a true gand, Peff, not just adopted. Can you find my damn credit chip? I seem to have lost it, the mercenary asked, partly as a test, partly joking. However, let's try it. Trace on. Fix him in the force. Trace his movements backwards. Hmm. The gand had prostitutes? Learned a new thing today. The female was busy spending his credits on another space station, buying a bunch of other females' drinks. Stolen novel, please report. Your female friend you visited four hours ago is throwing a party in your honor, esteemed Feinsman. And she brought seven more of her female friends, possibly to sample your prowess. If you hurry, they're at the Hut's Belly Pub. If you don't, well, if the credits are still well spent, it will just be another explorer enjoying their favor. I explained trying to remain polite, while returning the favor of a joke. The mercenary grumbled something and took off, heading towards nearest shuttle port, at a fast walk. Wait, you guessed right? Celine asked, looking at me with some wonder. What do my esteemed council members think? I asked the Feinsman. I, I did my own trace too. The credit chip is now inside the hut's belly, another Feinsman said, snorting at the unsaid joke. A true gand, we could use an immortal gand. I say I. Another Feinsman yelled, and the force trembled slightly. What? They really expected to kick me out next year. I. The council yelled in unison. Sue, I don't have to leave and be homeless again. I asked confused. Well, faking it really well. Emperor Pef for life, the female counselor demanded, pounding the table with her fist. Good girl. Did exactly as I instructed her. Uh, whatever, not like you will really live forever. It's just a title. Her father rumbled in his vocoder. I waited for the acclamation to subside. All right then. The first act as my immortal emperor is the creation of a grand army. To secure our freedoms and properties, and to expand the empire throughout the galaxy. Any and every able body is thus conscripted. Organics and synthetic, male or female, young or old. Esteemed council, I will let you in on the next target of our expansion. 
the centrality, a decadent and isolated polity, with a mere thousand systems. I believe we may need three years to liberate them and have their oppressed citizens join our empire. But, with me as your leader, it may only take two years, I proclaimed, floating my chassis a foot above the floor and pointing at the ceiling. Immortal Pef will set us free, Dora exclaimed standing up and punching the sky too. Good girl. One after another, the council rose and punched the sky. The Pef Wars had begun. Planet Gand, Pef Empire, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. In orbit, aboard the Imperial Space Station, the Celestial Throne. And then, I told them to shove their sabers up their droids' asses, climbed back in my ship and came back. Crazy droids everywhere, Vet concluded her story. She looked wonderful now, in a high-tech power armor, with personal shield even, and about 24 weapons on it. That armor must have costed its weight in gold. So, you failed. Why do I get such poor luck to have an incompetent maid and one that doesn't even care about me? I proclaimed, slapping my droid's head dramatically. My other maids frowned, looking up from their pads at the dingy sound. There, there, that replied, patting my shoulder with a distracted aura. They said they wanted to speak with you personally. Maybe you'll have better luck, that added while removing her helmet and taking out a last model of datapad. I confiscated it with telekinesis and started removing the hidden back doors placed inside the huts. Hey, give it back, you metalhead. This is the latest model from Corellia, Vet yelled, jumping up and down petulantly. Shoosh, adored maid. You heard of cyber intrusion and hacking, right? I replied, copying the latest variants of cyber warfare and adding them to my inventory. Oh, fix my armor too then. Half of the helmet is also just computers, the blue Twi'lek said, after deliberating inside her leku for a minute. Oh, don't worry, a state-of-the-art techno-union armor, bought for five million credits. It wasn't just a gift, I will reverse engineer it, and mass produce it for my army. And 24 different types of personal weapons too. Take it off and go see if you like the jacuzzi I built. Dora said it felt better than having sex, I told her, with a slight hook. Dora nodded absently from her pillow, and Vet raised an eyebrow. Then again, her experiences would have been forceful and not consensual at all. I wouldn't know, would I? Your crazy gand had me digging through the dirt with a pointy stick. I wasn't a high-class dancer like Dora. By the way, I rescued a few slaves. Can I keep three or four for my special project? Vet wondered, now clad in just a form-fitting jumpsuit. Really form-fitting, special project, eh? Our empire doesn't have slaves. You should know that. And our imperial servants choose their own lovers, if they want any. Plus, you kind of belong to me, adored maid. Body and soul, for eternity. I mused out loud, picking up the helmet and starting to decrypt its functions. Not fair. I have to wait till you build yourself a flesh body? That could take years. Start working on that sooner, Vet yelled as she entered the jacuzzi. She really wants some, Lyra observed wisely, still focusing on her data pad and learning diplomacy and negotiation courses. Well, you can always try to please one another, like kisses and stuff. It might be even fun, I replied, while busy stealing everything of value from the power armor. I'll give it a try. Vet seems a nice girl, Celine said, raising and walking towards the jacuzzi room. Afraid of men, but not really giving up on love. But hey, this might be fun to watch. We waited for a minute, but no screams or yelling were heard. Huh. Must have worked then. My voices and I exchanged an amused pulse through our bond. The third voice was not present though. Wyalu was still busy organizing her flock on sanctuary, setting up the droids for farming, building schools and workshops and power plants and everything a new colony would need. My planetside droids were busy building huge factories for pit droids and droideka and repulsor lift gunships. And elsewhere in the sanctuary system, my droids in their Gozenti cruisers were busy gathering asteroids and building a large space station and shipyards. And as soon as I got my hands on a tri-droid starfighter, they'll begin mass producing them. You will have to visit Dweem soon. Before they think again and run away, Lyra spoke softly, pressing a hand lightly on her kyber crystal. I can't. The Emperor doesn't go on trips to recruit people. Sad thing, they will all die soon, as the Yuzan Vong hate synthetic beings the most. I mused, going through my future memories. Criff, I'll go. If they are only half like you, they're still worth saving. And they'll make great field commanders for our droids. 
Lyra argued, then growled a little, taking off at a run towards the door. I smiled inward, and returned to my musings. If she went dressed in that skimpy skirt, even the Iron Knights may falter. A pair of Justice droids floated beside her, keeping up with ease. Hmm, I could wear a Justice droid, and add a power armor over it. Gain a few superpowers, and not be obvious I use the force. Super strength, repulsor jumps, deflector shield. Maybe integrate a few GAN dischargers and light masers. I'll have to see if tractor beams can be miniaturized for bipedal use. Triple the power capacitors, maybe add a starfighter reactor for a power source. Another partition drew my attention. One of the Falanasi was a traitor, in the old timeline, and most likely this one as well. Izella Talsala. I checked the cruiser manifest for her name. Not on board. Oh, well, at least she wouldn't know the location of Sanctuary. Dora, I have a mission for you. Take a frigate and two corvettes for escort, and find a Falanasi woman named Izella Talsava. She is trying to sell us out. Take a few finesmen, and bring her to me, alive, I told the Twilight. Back on Lukasek then. What should I tell her? Dora wondered. Give her a diamond, and promise her a large one, the size of her head. Just to teach me a few tricks, I explained, patting her head, and building a few fake memories while erasing the selling out part in the soul snare existence from her memories. Wouldn't do to spook the traitor when she read Dora's mind. I'll do my best, Peth. For the Empire, Dora proclaimed, patting her kyber crystal. You can promise her anything she wants, Dora. We have plenty money, I added as she turned to leave. The green twilight nodded and left, moving gracefully with small steps. Vet and Selene came back an hour later, their skin flushed and radiating contentment. You're the best, Peth. The jacuzzi was exactly like sex. Maybe even better, the blue twilight proclaimed, hugging my chassis with one arm. Celine blushed and sat down on her pillow in silence. Less talk and more study. You won't get your voice if you laze around. And this armor, you get it back when you know everything about orbital and planetary combat. I told Vet, as my telekinesis began dismantling her armor. Not fair. I worked hard for that armor, she complained resuming her lessons with a cute growl. And now Lyra went to fix up your mess. Oh, cruel world, why did I have to love such a lazy woman? I declared dramatically, shaking my arms at the sky. Shut up, defective droid. Let me study. I want that armor, Vet muttered, while trying to focus on her data pad. I'll sing this song that just came to me. It's called The Reason, Celine said softly, and began singing. Huh, some things stay the same, no matter the galaxy. Shard, Planet Gand, Peth Empire, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. In orbit, aboard the Imperial Space Station, the Celestial Throne. Fourth month, my first copy of the power armor has just finished reassembling when Lyra and her ship dropped out of hyperspace, and having aboard two extra force sensitives, an amphibian Sinisi and a crystalline one, probably a shard. This will be trickier, the Sinisi felt like a Jedi. I jumped inside my Black Justice series droid, and then entered my power armor. The neck and arm guards of my armor were laced with a frick alloy to prevent a skilled duelist from an easy win. Well, not really a win, but leaving me naked. Final checks, meshing the codes and then encrypting them again. Three GAN dischargers in my arms and helmet, a light maser gun and a disruptor rifle backing them up. Deflector shield, particle shield, repulsor beams. The armor will do well, I guess, if the Jedi came for violence. He would live to regret it. Sadly, the smallest tractor beam I could build so far only fitted on gunships. Then I left workshop and then my apartment, and entered the room next door which was my throne room, which featured a golden dais, with the golden throne sitting splendidly in the middle. But I avoided going to sit on it, the Jedi won't be impressed. I just floated a centimeter above the floor and waited, next to the large council table. Lyra is back, and seems upset, Wyla said softly not raising her head from her pad. One could never stop studying in this galaxy. Millions of species discovered things all the time, either through xenoarchaeology or by scientific experiments. I had it easier, just downloading entire public databases from universities and other easily hacked terminals. Vet looked at her then at me. It's the green crystal, isn't it? That's how you feel each other. That's such a cheat. When do I get mine? She demanded, pouting cutely. When you're ready, Vet. How can I send you out into the galaxy to speak in my name if you do not share my goals? 
I explained politely, then turned a little to include Selene into it. Just conquer the galaxy. Simple. What else could a crazy droid want? Vet muttered and punched her pillow. I faked a short laugh. True enough. Come now, Vet. You visited the dream just yesterday. You saw the first forest growing. Lakes with fish and lotus. Ammonia clouds gone. You visited the servants in their school. You went and rescued some of them yourself. Are they better now? I asked, just as the large doors opened and the Iron Knights delegation came in. Stupid droid. Using my own axe against me. I'm going out again, and rescue more. Can I have my armor back? She asked, arms crossed in front of her. Okay then, try not to die, yet. I answered with a sigh. Vet ran out, sticking her tongue out at the shard droid, as she passed the delegation. Really diplomatic, that one. Emperor Peff, I present you Jedi Master Kinos and his student, Iron Knightess Luxem. Lyra proclaimed, touching her crystal. Really? A female crystal? I sent with an amused tone in the bond. Lyra nodded, amused as well. Really? Emperor Peff, I hear you were elected emperor for life by the Gand. After you terraformed the planet in its entirety, the Jedi said, having intercepted my message, or just skimmed it from Lyra's surface thoughts. Yes, I did that. Took me almost three months. Had to modify a number of old nano-plagues to achieve the right balance. I answered, gesturing them to sit at the table. We sat at the table, and Wai Lu sat next to me, focusing on the shard droid. Hmm, quite a remarkable achievement. I knew I sensed something in the Force, but it wasn't really clear. And your own being is shrouded, masking almost every emotion. You do seem similar to my own Padawans, the Sinisi Jedi said, carelessly placing a scanner on the table and running scans on me. Good luck with that, Turquoise Jedi. You won't find anything. Merely on the surface, esteemed master. Or was that rank stripped away as well, when the Order declared you a heretic? I asked, while changing the readings on the scanner to make me look like Master Yoda. The scanner beeped, and the Jedi blinked twice in confusion. Master Yoda would never speak in clear sentences. Good joke, Tuff. Anyway, I'm still a master. If not a Jedi anymore. I studied everything about the Force, even if the Jedi Council was small-minded. The shards truly have the Force, he declared proudly. Study, do you say? A master, you say? The shards are interesting beings, with a nice Force ability, but a single one, their electromagnetic senses. They live for millennia and then die, of natural causes. And you taught them lightsaber forms, to get them killed even sooner. In fifty years, their whole race will be extinct. And it will be your fault, Master Akinos, I declared, pointing at the judge droid with a shard inside. Luxem tried to protest, but I kept her droid still and silent. What? How? I would never do anything to hurt them. Some kind of cataclysm or war. What did you see? The heretic master asked, trying to control his panic. You say you're a master, but you didn't even notice me. My group had lived thousands of years undetected by the Jedi Order. And there are thousands of groups like mine in the galaxy. Wailu spoke softly, placing a hand on the Sinisi's shoulder. You're a master too, but not of the Order. Altesian perhaps, Corellian Green Jedi? The confused master said, trying to locate Wailu, who sat down next to me, and invisible again. Go back to Dweem, initiate Akinos. We'll speak again in two years. If you learn humility till then, Luxem will stay and learn from us. I declared, waving him away in a dismissive gesture. Damn, the modern Jedi were feeble. I let go of the technopathic control over the Iron Knightess, curious what she will do. She looked around, then at her former master, who seemed lost. Sorry, Master Kinos. If there's anything that could save my species, I want to stay and learn. May the Force be with you, Luxem told him, bowing slightly with her droid chassis. As my droids came to escort the former Jedi out, I looked over the shard droid and noticed a lightsaber hanging from her belt. Toys for kids! I grabbed it up with telekinesis and waved it around. Made pleasant sounds though. No more toys, dear maid. Cybersecurity and infiltration. Guess you'll do just fine in my black ops. I told her, tossing the damn thing over my shoulder. It landed perfectly on a pillow at the base of my throne. The first of many to follow. Planet Gand, Pef Empire, Outer Rim, 25 BBY. In orbit, aboard the Imperial Space Station, the Celestial Throne. Fifth month, the small council was something I loved in a certain book. And I reverted to it, now that my rank wasn't in danger of being taken away. 
most Feinsmen were kept busy exploring the sector for trade routes and diplomatic alliances. Include clauses for our Navy to refuel and defend their system and secure mining rights and promise ecological help where possible. Twenty systems have joined the Empire, in all but name, paying maintenance and salaries for the ships defending them, receiving new factories and jobs, getting rid of slavery, getting linked into the Empire Holonet. I messaged every individual leader through Holocom and urged them to establish planetary defenses and at least one orbital space station for trade. While we went to talk with those more recalcitrant, using mind tricks to smooth their minds towards an alliance. Lyra went to speak with those more open-minded, while Vet, well, she made herself a sort of admiral, exhausting her group of twelve finesmen to locate and engage more pirates and slavers all over the sector. And she found a group of three Jalshays somewhere, who follow her around, for whatever reason. Something about a holy maiden and the quest for freedom. And now Dora is returning, with a female force sensitive on board. Peth, I know that girl. I taught her, Wailu said a minute later. Izella, yes, she wanted to sell you out to the Sith, or maybe the Jedi. I answered, most of my partitions focused on keeping a billion parts from our MC-40 cruiser separated, while I reverse-engineered the whole ship at once. Scanning each part, a millisecond for every single one. Why did I have to do this sequentially? You saw it? Oh my, it was her desire for an easy life, wasn't it? Wailu asked rhetorically, she could sense it in our bond. I wouldn't lie to her. Who knows, my dear voice. Organics go crazy all the time. Just look at Vet, I answered amused. Wailu turned for a second to look at me, then resumed her studies. Building holocrons. Not like anything you might imagine. Instead of engineering, think of baking cakes. The soul snares are not holocrons. The souls inside are sentient, she concluded, after a short deliberation. Holocrons mean different things. They are eyes of a sort. They use the physical force and not the cosmic force. And the Sith use the living force instead. Different forces, different results, even if they look similar. I explained, guiding myself by my old memories. And yet there is a single force. I think nobody is really a master. After all, Wailu complained, waving the soul snare away with a force push. She's beginning to learn telekinesis, after yearning for it all her life. Of course not, not for all the teachings and abilities out there. We are a prism, and the force passes through us, diffracting into a myriad of colors. And every one of us is different and sees different colors. The white current may be the unifying force. Bending light should be a property of gravity after all, I mused, while the hyperdrive finished reassembling. 0 0.9 hyperdrive speed now, for our ships. How did Han Solo obtain 0 0.5 hyperdrives for that crappy ship of his? Damn plot armor. Emperor Pef, what about hyperspace and mass shadows? Where would they figure on the spectrum? Luxem asked, looking ridiculous in maid robes. But a skirt would look even more ridiculous on a droid. Despite what Robo-Maid's ideas I might have. Well, the mass shadows would also be in the unifying force. Or perhaps a new one, for dark matter. I'm just a 12 millennia old droid. What do I know? I answered, faking annoyance. We remained silent afterwards, Luxem learning cyber warfare, Wailu still experimenting with holocrons, and myself learning 50,000 years of technology by taking it apart and reassembling it. Sublight engines, hypermatter reactor, deflector shields. They used some kind of thermal buffers, prolonging the resistance under fire, and redundant capacitors to allow faster recharge. And yet an ion cannon would still bring them down. Ionize, I could use this to craft an ability against droids. Only droids would just listen to me. Regardless, only the Vong had a real change of putting up a fight, after all. Dora landed after a while, bringing Izella with her. Wailu vanished, letting a faint wisp of sorrow be felt in her aura. Hey, you the droid emperor? Where's my gold? Izella asked, expecting me to know what Dora promised her. Here, take this diamond for now. I want to learn how to vanish. I answered instead, throwing the soul snare towards her. The woman was very beautiful and perhaps used to being treated like a princess everywhere. She caught the crystal, and looked at it confused. Hey, this is not a diam. Then a long wail in the force, as her soul became trapped inside. Luxem rose and went to poke at it. Is this how you become immortal? You transfer in a crystal? She asked, quite smartly. Yes and no, the soul snare is a weapon, to be used against enemies and traitors. A failed experiment with the cosmic force. 
but now is a one-time use holocron as well. Watch, I told my crystal maid, draining the knowledge from the snare. All the religious precepts, the white current, the illusions, the invisibility, mind shield, mind fog, hiding in the light, seeing from light, acceleration. The last one was surprising. It forced the body to burn faster, healing immediately or moving fast, while damaging the body immensely. If you were organic, the story has been taken without consent. If you see it on Amazon, report the incident. Wailu reappeared next to me and took the snare with care. She was like a daughter to me. Let me take her life. I want to know, Wailu said softly, training the last of Izella's soul and making it vanish. I just waited and focused my telekinesis on reassembling the MC-40 light cruiser, the missile launchers and the missiles being a hundred times easier. The cruiser now had 100 missile launchers and 3,000 missiles. The turrets were of, however, as I didn't like having them pointed at every side, like a hedgehog. Keep 20% of current positioning, and arrange the rest above and below the ship in super-firing positions, thus allowing 80% of all weapons to focus fire on a single target, both when firing forward or either sides. In total, 20-point defense quad lasers, 100 medium macers and turbo lasers and 20 heavy macers. Already, my cruiser would be able to take down a Venator Star Destroyer by itself, while being half the size and three times the firepower of a Venator. Damn, those Venators were weak ships for a Star Destroyer, being mostly a carrier with some ship-to-ship -ship ability. And going by what I knew about the centrality, they didn't even have Star Destroyers. I still needed many more ships, though. To conquer the centrality would be pretty easy, but then I had to hold a thousand star systems against everyone who might try to profit. At least a thousand corvettes then, just to secure that volume. I barely had a hundred. Criff had to make lots of money fast and buy the damn ships from somewhere. And I just knew how to find the money. Murder and theft, the privilege of kings and emperors. Luxem, I need you to steal five billion credits, I proclaimed, pointing at the shard maid. Hey, she wondered confused. If I had teeth, I would have smiled. Damn organics have it so easy. Planet Gand, capital of Pef Empire. Throne room, aboard the Celestial Throne. The seat of government. 25 BBY. What I mean is, we're going to infiltrate the centrality and steal credits from their pension funds. And just think, they use Republic credits, even if they do not issue the currency. I replied, preparing a Black Ops freighter for launch. Wait, you're going to? Dora asked shaking her green twin Leku in confusion. Of course, I have to supervise the first act of war. Can't just laze around while my operatives risk their lives, I explained, watching Luxem carefully. She was doubtful. Why are we attacking them? They aren't harming anyone. Luxem wondered, hesitating for some moral reasons. We're preventing a genocide, several of them in fact, and also preventing the Sith taking over the centrality and becoming our nemesis. Come, let's get you fitted with supremacy power armor, Luxem, you'll learn more while we're in transit. I added, and began assembling my next generation power armor series, around the justice droid that housed my sentient crystal maid. I made sure to leave a number of slits in the chest carapace, then armored those openings with a triple layer of ancient Jedi armor. The Iron Knights used transparasteel windows in their chests, to let their crystal senses function unimpeded by the droid chassis, but that was too much of a weakness and giveaway. Ten minutes later, the Iron Maid was complete and looked absolutely fabulous. 2.5 meters in height, powerful servo motors for super strength, repulsor beams for lift and glide, deflector shields, latest model of miniaturized starfighter reactor. Once Luxem learned to use the force properly to reinforce the armor, it will be able to withstand nukes at point blank range. For color, I went with urban gray camouflage, shades of gray with subtle changes in degree and patterns to make the user less visible in a city landscape. It had an infiltration spec after all, with a powerful hollow transceiver, able to slice through most networks. Just buying the technology had cost me 50 million credits. Now it was time to put it to good use, and return my investment a hundredfold. My own power armor was painted a dull gray, with black shoulders and a golden ring around the temples. A kyber crystal was mounted on the side of my chest, to let my subjects know the user had a voice as well. Five billion credits is way too little for you to go on trips. You're planning something else, Wailu sent telepathically. Of course, but I also have to test my new maid. 
You should return to Sanctuary as well. My hands have the Empire running well enough for now. I sent back. Have fun then. And bring me a Sith. I really want to learn all they know, Wailu added, vanishing from my senses completely. Damn, the woman was good. Even with learning most of the Falanasi teaching from her traitor student, Wailu was still above my level in camouflage. No wonder Palpatine couldn't find her, even after she was betrayed. Luxem was experimenting with her new upgrades, floating around and playing with her shields. Lyra and Dora, start placing orders for any ship you can find, to be paid on delivery. Buy a dozen Lucre Hulk class LH-3210 cargo freighter if you find any. I'll be back in a month, Selim. You have one month to decide. Servant, voice her freedom and exile. Maybe you could be a singer on Narshada. I told my other maids, then started walking towards my ship. Selene nodded, feeling scared and hiding behind her long blonde hair. I doubted she will choose the voice though. Luxem joined me as I passed the doors, feeling anxious for some reason. She was competent enough now, but her resolve lacked. Oh well, that's why I came along. Now, planning and executing the greatest heist in the history of the galaxy will be fun. On board Greymist, Pef Empire's Black Ops vessel. In hyperspace, en route to Ocean, the centrality's richest planet. Emperor, stealing from the pension funds might trigger social outrage and revolts. Is this what we're trying to accomplish? Luxem asked, going over the files on security of the centrality again. Not yet. The theft will be noticed, and they'll have to move the funds somewhere safe. A Republic bank, or possibly the banking guild. And thus, lose control over their finances. Half of their navy will turn pirate. For lack of salaries, I explained, while trying to use acceleration on myself. I had no organic flesh to degrade, so everything will be in my mind. Time started to slow down as my perception began to accelerate faster and faster. Double Excel, triple Excel, I wondered how much I could overclock myself. Five times and I started to overheat. Transfer heat outside the hall. Seven times, the exterior of my crystal self began warming up. Let's stop for now. I could possibly reach ten times more, but wasn't needed. Four times faster. No overheat. The force supporting the extra speed just fine. It should be enough. I glided through the lightsaber velocities, stressing my droid chassis to the limit. Hmm, about the same speed as Yoda and Palpatine in their duel. A bit less than Windu going full vapad, but I'll never get tired or exhausted. Damn, this body was a, such a cheat. Emperor, you move so fast. Faster than Master Aquino's. Faster than anyone I heard of. Luxem exclaimed, now her aura trembling with awe. About the same as the best Jedi or Sith living today. Master Windu might be a tad faster with a lightsaber. I answered, coming to a rest and running the meditation techniques, using the armor's servo motors to emulate breathing. Hmm. It did seem to work, increasing my connection to the Force by a few percents. But you don't use sabers. You think them pure real, Luxem added, now observing me with a strange focus. Once you get strong enough, lightsaber become crutches and start hindering your abilities. And they make you channel on a fixed path, ending with a saber duel. Ignoring better solutions, or strategic thinking or subtlety. Let's say I drop a bioweapon on the Jedi Temple. How many Jedi would survive 10 minutes or even 1 minute? I asked, letting the female shard meditate on an answer. I rehearsed my plan again, then started building variants and backup plans. Most masters would survive 1 minute. But, just a few the next 10 minutes, you could end the Jedi anytime. You've used 50 nanophages already. When you terraformed planet Gand. And not a single Gand was harmed. Luxem concluded her reasoning after an hour or so. The Jedi and the Sith would continue to fight, Geno sitting each other, for a hundred millennia or more, devastating the galaxy with their insane fanaticism, just like have done for the past thirty millennia. It has to stop. What do you think, Luxem? I asked rhetorically. She remained silent, possibly thinking about her own race. It's gonna happen again, right? The Sith are coming back. And they're going to exterminate the Jedi and everyone who allies with them. Including my fellow shards. A galaxy-wide war. And soon. Why doesn't anyone else see this? My maid asked, her aura mingling fear and calm at equal ratio. Chancellor Palpatine leads the Galactic Republic. And he's a Sith. His office is next door from the Jedi Council. That's a cosmic joke right there. And the Jedi's chosen one. The one who will bring balance in the Force. He's groomed to become the next Sith. How do they think balance will be restored? Damn fools, I muttered, 
spilling secrets like candy. Sentient crystals didn't have glands to secrete hormones and neurotransmitters, but they could fake them pretty well with electrical impulses. My Iron Maid stayed silent after this, digesting the news. A few hours later, we reached Ocean and began our missions. Ocean system, the centrality, outer rim, running silent at the edge of the system. Luxem sliced into the centrality's servers and began funneling funds to fake corporations, which dissolved immediately after transferring the credits to another fake corporation and so on. And while she was doing the shell game with the centrality pensions, I went after the richest man in the galaxy. Bohu Amuta had a wealth approximating 400 trillion credits and had just moved to asteroid Ocean 5792, where his obese shape would hurt less due to low gravity. He did have a state-of-the-art security system around his palace, but he was illiterate, so he had to speak his passwords aloud. I just had to wait an hour for him to buy something, emulate his voice and hollow signature, then start buying everything on the markets and selling it a million times cheaper to a fake corporation. In 30 minutes I drained most of his liquid assets, about 14 trillions credits, then started selling his real estate holdings, corporate stocks, ships and factories, again to fake corporations that just began existing seconds ago. I took everything from him, leaving him penniless. In three hours, I became myself the richest person in the galaxy, though not quite legal. Then I used my own name to start a few companies and bought all I have stolen from Muta, in my own name. And last thing, I alerted my security in my own palace on asteroid Ocean 5792 of an unauthorized obese intruder and had him shot in the head. Now, my new wealth was legal. I started firing all the lawyers and corporate and security personnel, leaving just the majority of the grunts in my employ. My workers still need a job to feed their families, but I wouldn't trust the cronies that Muta had. I began hiring new office workers, while my security droids kicked out the former employees and shot those resisting. Somehow, every one of the corporate boards resisted being fired from their job, and thus were fired upon. A few shuttles with freshly bought droids descended on my palace and started upgrading and replacing the old security, wiping the records and evaporating the corpses. Emperor! I finished. I just stole five billion credits. What do I do now? Luxem asked, brimming with excitement. Be nice to your sister maids and share the money with them. A billion for each of you should be a nice gift, I think. I mused out loud. But, but don't you need the credits to buy ships? This was just to test me. Luxem wondered, now a little more than confused. Oh, I stole 400 trillions while you had fun. You could buy yourself something nice, an asteroid somewhere or a star destroyer. I answered amused. The poor dude was going to be killed and impersonated by a croak anyway. I just did the galaxy a huge favor. Oh, I'm a billionaire now. I'm going to buy so many things. I bet Vet will want that Star Destroyer, though. She likes guns. Big guns, Luxem muttered, trawling the auctions for life crystals and whatever else she fancied. The heist complete, I began looking for my next target. Sorcerers of Tund, in hyperspace, en route to planet Tund. The centrality. Hmm. I could use perhaps 10 trillion credits right away and order a thousand star cruisers to be built for me on Mon Calamari. Would take a year at least, while the shipyards were built and the ships produced in a system I didn't own. Yeah, let's not do that and find my ships confiscated by the Senate. Or I could buy some squid corporations and build shipyards in my own empire, away from Jedi and Republic eyes. Much better, buy a few droid manufacturers as well. Yeah, that sounded safer in short term, and perhaps even profitable in long term. Give my future trillions of citizens jobs? Sure. Still, the prospect of a full-scale war with the centrality annoyed me. Why did I even have to fight them? I could just become central administrator as well, then unite my separate states in a personal union for as long as I live. I just needed to provoke a crisis, then step in to resolve it and be perceived as their savior. And who better to blame than the insane sorcerers? And give me a reason to make them vanish. Emperor, are you going to kill the sorcerers of Tund? Luxem asked me suddenly. A few of them for sure. I'm quite certain the first ones we meet will be impolite or aggressive. And after we drain their souls, we'll be seen as sorcerers as well. So, it should work to blame them as evil beings that want to destroy all life in the sector for some insane ritual. I explained, while trying to use meditation on my ad partitions without much success. Damn thing was conceived by people with organic brains. I had no chemicals to balance in my neocortex. 
What? They're going to kill so many people? My maid said shocked. Well, yes and no. One of them will sacrifice the whole planet, thus becoming the most powerful sorcerer, and the only one as well. You heard of Revan? I asked curious, while a thousand libraries opened in my mind, showing what little was known of his real life. Old Sith, I think, killed the whole fleet? Luxem replied hesitantly. Jedi? Dark Jedi. Sith Lord, Jedi, Dark Lord of Sith, and finally Jedi Ghost. If the man had problems, he might have slept with his own mother too. And he killed an entire planet and drained the life from it. Became quite powerful. For his times, I mused, trying to find a rhyme for that poor soul. Wait, he died and after that he became a Jedi again. And he's now an immortal spirit? After all he's done? Luxem exclaimed confused. Yep. Bringing balance to the Force is quite a ride. If you go by Jedi religious tenets, I laughed amused. So, everything I learned was a lie? The crystal shard maid demanded. An aura of desperation around her. No, my adored maid. You cannot be told you were wrong. You have to see it for yourself. I patted her shoulder. Let's try it differently. Death, yet the Force, the last teachings of the old Jedi. Now, let's see what the Sith say. The Force shall set me free. See anything strange? I asked in a teasing voice, trying fake breathing again by using the droid and armor servos. It worked. Why did this work? Was this some sort of psychological placebo? Think it matters, and it does. I was a bloody piece of rock. I didn't need to breathe or eat or anything. I just existed in the Force. Well, they both speak of the Force, not of the light or dark side. Both sects see immortality as the final goal. Only, the means are different. Luxem replied after an hour of slow deliberation. Are they? Which kind of genocide is more heretic, killing the Jedi or the Sith? I wondered rhetorically. Our ship dropped of hyperspace before she could respond, if she had any response to give. I didn't. I drew on the force and cloaked our ship again, this time hiding in light. Worked better against Sith, planet tund, the centrality. My force senses expanded. Technopathy writing the data transmissions and commercial transactions in Holonet News followed soon after by cyber warfare programs and other slicing tools. Sadly, the sorcerers of Tund barely had any data sphere defenses, most of those focused on space stations and spaceports and banks. Old tech, too, at least five generations behind the galactic core. My droid pilots entered our ship on a landing trajectory, still undetected. Hide your force aura, dear maid. Let's not scare our prey too soon, I said softly, as our cloaked ship landed just outside the capital. The planet was sparsely populated, mainly by immigrant Tongs and humans and some Sith. The species, the sorcerers were much fewer still, barely a few thousands. They ruled the prairies with their megacratic cabal, and ignored the forests. Some palaces here and there, defended by powerful force fields. Those palaces must be their attempt at a dark council. Pitiful, I glided above the grass, using the repulsor lifts to float like a boss, and headed towards the nearest market with a basketball-sized crystal in my hand. Luxem glided next to me, with her own snare in one hand. We probably made quite a sight, in our gray power armors. The locals made way respectfully, some even bowing deeply. Huh, respecting my authority already? Probably thought we were sorcerers, most likely. About an hour later, three red-skinned individuals, with black robes around them, challenged our right to buy stuff like tourists do. Who are you mongrels? Where did you get those armors? And those diamonds? Give them here. One of them commanded first in Sith, then in Galactic Basic, while sparking lightning from one hand, and a fireball in another. Well, if you really ask, how can I refuse? Catch! Two of them, the males, caught the soul snare crystals and became trap spirits, while the third, a female Sith, I shot with my neural discharger and left paralyzed. Wailu said she wanted one, so why not? Now let's see. Drain, yummy drain. I mean brains. Masasi rituals. Kiss I old gods. Sith teachings. Rakata teachings. Elemental shaping. Shadow shaping. Mental domination. Listen from shadows. Huh. Maybe I need to find a higher rank. This one didn't even have meditation or lightsaber forms. Nor alchemy, nor life drain, nor most of the anything Sith were renowned for. Emperor? What is this joke? These can't be the Sith. Luxem argued as well, while digesting what she just learned. A tong older male stepped closer and looked at the bodies lying in dirt. The bearded one was the leader, though. 
Some say he was the strongest sorcerer in centuries. He explained politely, then spit on his corpse. I'll be damned. They faked it all, with tricks and compulsions. They are pure-blooded Sith, the original natives on Korriban. Just, but not the Sith we were looking for, I mused, kicking the dead Sith in the nuts. Well then, let's pack the rest of them up in a ship and go back home. I grabbed the female and the other bodies with telekinesis and floated away, heading towards the nearest sorcerer palace. Guess I can dump them on Sanctuary too. On a different continent, they were still Force users, if barely. Planet Tund. Centrality, 25 BBY. The Cabal maintained a pretty strong defense on their palaces, the force field emitters appearing to be force-powered. Rocketon Tech. Most likely, since I knew the force field survived the destruction of the planet, when that croak sorcerer destroyed Tund with some kind of torpedo. I'll have to turn the fields off and take them with me. Nice tech to have, if I could use it. The old Rakata ship that brought the Sith here had been dismantled during the millennia after their exodus, but the shield emitters still functioned, and at a higher strength than anything possible today, much stronger than the shields on Mandator Star Destroyers, for example. Guess I'll fit one to my celestial throne and make my Imperial space station pretty much invulnerable. As I approached the palace, a number of guards appeared and stared shocked at their former master being dragged along, floating in midair. I searched through the memories and found the access codes for the shield. It turned off, and we entered the palace, ignoring the guards. Some of them had metal spears. Luxem organized the palace to receive a few thousands guests. Call it a feast for the cabal. I'll invite the rest of the sorcerers to join. I demanded, while disarming the guards by simply taking away their weapons. As you say, immortal emperor, my maid replied, grabbing the nearest guard and barking orders. Meanwhile, I explored the palace, taking over the security and whatever droids I could find, then locating the living quarters and the families of the dead sorcerers. I found a creche for young Sith, eleven boys and nine girls, and about twenty wives, probably ten each if these two were brothers and shared equally. They had a pleasant life so far. My captive seemed to be a sister of theirs, or maybe a wife, or both. Pure blood is hard to maintain, after all. Still, there was no point in keeping her paralyzed. I snared her soul and threw all three bodies in the middle of the room. Sparing lives might be seen as weak for Sith, or something. Ah, they had a secret subspace transmitter, keyed to contain all the Cabal's frequencies. Very convenient. I decrypted its controls and placed a holoconference with all of them at once. This story has been stolen from Royal Road. If you read it on Amazon, please report it. Greetings, my Sith. I am the Immortal Emperor, and I've come to take you home. Come to my palace in six hours, all of you, I said, gesturing at the dead bodies at my feet, then ended the call. Some of them might not come, and they'll die, but the news of my arrival had to have time to spread and acknowledge, and so I was graceful and gave them time to think it through. And then, I went to have a chat with the ex-wives, to give them to the good news. You killed all three of them. They were rude, I answered, faking a shrug with my armor's pauldrons. Please don't kill the younglings. You can take anything just not. Another wife exclaimed, wailing with grief. I don't waste loyal soldiers. Now go help my maid prepare a feast for the cabal. Food and drinks, I replied, pointing at her. She took another wife with her and ran out. How many are coming? The stores might not have. Another ex-wife interfered. All of them. And place a hundred barrels of wine and whatever outside the gates for their guards. I told a younger wife who seemed less confused. She nodded and ran outside. Hmm. A Sith maid? She did seem capable. Nah, too much trouble trying to fend off the dark side. How do we call you, mighty sorcerer? Yet another wife asked. Immortal Emperor, or Peth, or combinations. Full name for official meetings. Understood Emperor Peth. I'll go see after the young ones. She replied and took off towards the creche. Now, let's see about defenses. A single missile launcher? And whatever the guards had. Useless. I descended deep under the palace and found the shield emitters. Yeah, rocket and tech aren't. I didn't have a clue how to operate it. I got lost for hours, trying to decrypt and mesh with its systems. And I barely understood a single percent. Emperor, more Sith are coming, my maid alerted me. Great, shields online. Keep a three meter wide aperture aligned with the palace gate. Aim the missile launcher at the gate as well. I floated up to the large meeting room and started arranging everything with telekinesis. Chairs and tables to the sides, a makeshift throne for me, a pillow for my mate. The sorcerers of Tund began entering. 
one by one, while my maid has to keep telling them to leave the guards outside. One hour later, the room was packed, and the rest didn't have anywhere to go so just waited outside. I pushed, lifting the upper floors and the outer wall, forming a larger room, while keeping the whole thing suspended. That might have impressed them a little. I wonder what they'll say when they'll see me dismantle a Star Destroyer into little bits. My Sith, you were lost, but not forgotten. The Dark Jedi you followed are long dead, but I haven't forgotten. I was alive ten millennia ago, when the Crusades passed through this space. I've seen wars and genocides, empires rising and falling, but I haven't forgotten you. I saw your deaths, the entire ton planet obliterated by one of your future recruits. And I said, no more, enough is enough, I have come to save you, and teach you, and take you home. I orated, using elemental shaping to create a flaming aura around me. Where are you planning to take us, mighty emperor? An older Sith asked, remaining unfazed. Just another planet nearby, same kind of planet, with grass and trees, a few lakes. Only nobody knows about it, or the route to it, and thus safe, for you and your children. I call it sanctuary. Are you a Jedi or a Sith? Emperor? Another Sith sorcerer? One badly burned and looking like a veteran? Demanded. You are the true Sith. The Dark Jedi or something else. Haters and betrayers of their fanatic brothers. I am nothing like either of those. I am Pef. And I came to tell you a simple truth. The Force is one. There are no sides. Like sunlight. It bathes us with nourishment. And feeds us. I am the living proof. Not eating. Not even breathing. I exist in the Force. And so can you, I explained, raising the snare high above my armor. The spirit Sith inside the snare looked at the living Sith and tried to yell something. Nothing came out, but it was clear that she was quite alive inside. And with that, the argument was over. Everyone wants to be immortal. Planet tunned. Centrality. A week later, the last of the sorcerers and their families had boarded the ships I had bought specially for this task, with a few fake corporations and set course for a system in the Pef Empire's exclusion zone. Wailu will take over from there and take them to Sanctuary. They didn't actually need to know the route the ships will take, after all. Not that I didn't trust them, since if I strained I could throw them very far. Okay, I didn't trust them one bit. They'll have to be trained and indoctrinated, just like the Imperial servants. I looked at every single one as they boarded and hadn't noticed any infiltrator, but then again, there were millions of Force abilities out there, some more equal than others. Hmm. Let's establish a hospital station on Sanctuary and quarantine everyone, while they receive blood tests and immunizations. Gonna be expensive, but then again, I had quite enough money. I still couldn't believe how easy the heist went. I was a trillionaire. Then again, Centrality Intelligence was busy at that time, most likely going nuts over the pension heist, and didn't have time to concentrate on a concurrent heist on a private individual. They'll come knocking soon enough though, better have the next operation in place. I began modeling a hollow announcement by a recently deceased sorcerer, going over his insane plans to drain the largest planets in the centrality of all life, and become a god of magic. Plant rumors of Emperor Pef, engaging all the sorcerers of Tund at once, and chasing them away, after killing the majority. And now, let's see nukes bloom. I chose a few more distant palaces, and began the detonations, a few of them caught in accidental new reports going live. Exactly like flowers, only less radiation and more explosion. And jump, en route to Sillal, centrality. I'm beginning to think you just wanted to see things go boom, just like that, Luxem muttered, playing the last holos were recorded before the jump. A bouquet of red flowers, for the prettiest shard I know, I answered, while my partitions focused on analyzing the ricotta force field in the cargo hold. I think my compliment worked since the Iron Maid flashed a burst of embarrassment and annoyance in her aura. I am the only shard, you know, she muttered back, then returned to her own studies. Damn thing was a thousand times more advanced than anything I've seen. And right now, I was probably the foremost expert in modern tech in the galaxy. And a living example of such tech as well. Only Ricotta tech was not modern, but Xenoarchaeology, and I knew too little about those. Slightly faded memories about Antikman came forward but didn't fit with what I had here. Alchemy and imbuement and force matrices, and a hundred other things, hidden inside one another, sometimes intersecting in different dimensions. Made a holocron look like a Rubik cube, in comparison. Semi-sentient code, almost like my own AI partitions. 
Dangerous stuff. Criff. No wonder the Ricotta defeated the Celestials and chased them away from the galaxy. How could you beat them? If their tech was this advanced. So advanced it was magic. I gave up my efforts at 3% and hoped to find someone with knowledge about this stuff and pick his brains about it. My servos creaked as the droid's fist clenched. I sighed upset. Magic is hard, so you can feel emotions, after all. Was that desperation? Luxem asked amused. Don't like when something is too advanced to understand. It means someone smarter may use this against me or my people. I muttered, going back to breathing exercises. Peace through strength. I needed to become stronger. You're such a mystery emperor. I can see you float in the force, going through the velocities or breathing exercises. And yet you cannot meditate. Maybe you think too much. Luxem added with a trace of sadness. I was only thinking, an AI. And how do you make an AI stop thinking? Let's try the codes and go through each of them. Emotion. Yet peace. The first tenant before the Dark Jedi even appeared. But was it the first? The Jedi were first, and they claimed different things. In the light, there is a darkness. And in the darkness, a light. Strive to live in balance. In balance with chaos and harmony. Immortal in the Force. I had the last thing done, somehow. Through cheating like a boss. But not the rest. Balance. Chaos was simple. Everything was chaos. From randomness to life, then evolution, then social relations, then wars, then death. Where was the harmony? I just couldn't see it. Was harmony a function of chaos, like the wings of the butterfly? A dream, sometimes perceived as precognition. Where did prescience come from? Who lived in the futures that I never lived? I mused on this for hours and hours. The ship dropping out of hyperspace woke me, and I noticed the shard maid had creeped really close, and was peering at my armor's chest with fascination. In orbit above planet Silo. And now you did it. Meditation. I felt it. For a minute, just before we dropped out, she muttered, then hugged me with her own power armor. Huh, and now I'm a Padawan too. I answered, while my partitions began their work on the largest ship manufacturer in the centrality. I began slicing and dicing, taking over every single open server and quite a few of those with lesser protections. A Navy cruiser changed course and came to fly on our left. Emperor Peth, we have a few questions. An official voice transmitted, along with some credentials. I checked to make sure but I already knew who they were. Centrality Intelligence, Counterintelligence Group 4, trying to catch me off guard before I hid behind an army of lawyers and diplomatic immunity. Exactly as planned. Flowers, on board Grey Mist, in orbit above Sillo. They weren't as stupid as I hoped, though. They had a force sensitive on board, and a Type 1 hadn't encountered till now. Twi'lek, but colored deep red. Metal discs on her belt. Possibly telekinetic and certainly telepathic. Oh, well. I was always open to meeting pretty girls. White Fog Luxem. They have a telepath. I said, doing the same. Criff, I knew something will go wrong, eventually. The maid muttered, a hand going for the lightsaber she didn't have anymore. Be back in a few hours, I added, as I entered the transit tube. On board Centrality Cruiser Intractable, I was met by two officers, in red and black uniforms, and a platoon of marines, wearing light armors and carrying blasters. Yeah, that would be really useful against power armor. Air, Emperor Peth is coming too? One officer asked cautiously, noticing me staying afloat, and the menacing armor. I am Peth, conference room? I replied politely, and started floating towards the nice room they had for admirals and such. The ship's systems were already under my control, including gravity and the air they breathe. And they had thousands of droids on board as well, from tiny mouses to repair models and astromechs. I was basically at home. The marines ran after us, clutching their pitiful guns with tensed hands. This might be pretty easy, after all. These people haven't fought a war in a thousand years. And most of the galaxy hadn't either. Like candy from babies, now let's see. Bet likes to drink some sort of ultra-sweet juice. Have a droid bring some to my new telepathic friend. By the time I arrived in the conference room, a protocol droid came in and placed a cup in front of the Twi'lek. She has seen combat before though. Scars and burns, and a wary presence, always conscious of surroundings. The droid surprised her, since it wasn't alive to be felt with telepathy. You kinda need technopathy instead. Now, decrypt the payment charts. Losty Vera, Zeisen Shaw Auxiliary, payment grade at captain levels, triple bonus for high-risk mission, paid in advance. Well, at least they did take me seriously. Huh, 
I knew a little about the Zeiss and Shah sect, just that they were strong enough to have resisted assimilation by the Jedi, Palpatine's Empire, and the Vong. Pretty much do-it-yourself type of people. I offered a short bow and gestured at the drink. My compliments, Miss Lostivira. I hear such drinks are highly regarded by beautiful Twi'leks, I said, remaining afloat in front of the table. Thin rails on the chairs, way below the resistance necessary to support power armor weight. You could take a seat, Emperor. This might take some time. Power armor is kind of heavy, I replied amused. You could take it off. Make yourself comfortable, I assure you. You aren't in any danger. Of course not, Miss Vera. Wearing this version of power armor, I could withstand point-blank nuclear detonations. I explained truthfully, I could indeed survive quite fine. Yes, about those horrible detonations. Are you able to recall how they happened, Emperor? I fought with some crazy magicians. I think a number of them may have escaped. My bodyguard may have missed some, I answered, being truthful, but not too much. The Twi'lek turned towards her handlers and gestured up and down with the eye that wasn't facing me. Cool trick, only I could see what the droid in the room saw as well. Hmm, she was still reading me somehow. Hide in shadows and mind shield. The fog wasn't enough. The Twi'lek took a long pause and sipped her drink. Seems I was spot on. She really liked it. It is very good juice. Lowers certain inhibitions in Twi'leks. Perhaps even beautiful ones, my interrogator said. Amused. Damn it. What was the crazy girl drinking on my money? Just made a fool of myself. I gestured a shrug, feigning being innocent. I wouldn't know. Never been a Twi'lek in my life. She let that go and tried something else. So, I heard you're the richest emperor in the galaxy. And presumably immortal as well. What are your plans regarding the properties you hold in the centrality? You do represent a foreign power, after all. Planet Gand, I believe. Immortal is just a title. There are beings who have lived longer than me, after all. Croak species, for example, can reach 20 millennia in age. I'm barely half a... I guess we'll have to wait and see. I explained politely, holding a data pad aloft with telekinesis and turning on the hollow news. Hmm. Planet Tund was just quarantined by a large centrality navy force. A few Jedi on site. The sorcerers had been declared a nationwide threat and everyone and everything was looking for them, and droids were sifting through the radioactive ruins. The girl exchanged a worried look with the intelligence officers. Probably the interview didn't go exactly as they planned. Did you intervene to prevent the mass murder of our citizens, Emperor Peff? You're clearly highly able in the Force and otherwise, the Zeisen Shaw wondered, eyeing my data pad again. Now she noticed I didn't use my hands to turn on the holos. A bit late, but not bad. Yes. I acted to prevent a genocide, multiple ones, in fact. I would do my empire no good if billions of refugees start flooding our borders. However, the croak who impersonated that fat guy escaped. Maybe we should act together in this. I do hold many valuable properties in centrality after all. It would be a pity to have to move them elsewhere. I said, baiting my hooks. One of them should catch something. Like most of our shipyards, here in Sillo, 16 billion families depend on those jobs. The older officer spoke, now for the first time. Mr. Colin, you'd make a great officer someday. In my navy, here it comes, my own offer. I was thinking to request centrality citizenship for tax purposes. Maybe public office too. One day, I mused aloud. The man perked up, his brain lighting up in my senses. Okay then, he's smart enough to see where this is going. Do you know the name of the croak, Emperor Peff? We'll need to apprehend that individual as soon as possible. We suspected but never had a clear line to him. The officer asked, now very polite. I nodded. His name is Rekur Gepta. Generally hides in the ankles of his impersonations. Blood samples taken from ears or fingertips should work, if you're doubtful. He was also interested in the Sharu and the Oswald. And, not for science, I concluded, focusing my senses on the Twi'lek woman. She glanced at her boss and nodded. Great! Having the centrality intelligence go on a hunt for that croak maniac might train them for what is to come. That Sith monster had killed billions of sentients before. And will do so again, if not for my intervention. All right then, the centrality owes you gratitude for your help, Emperor. I'm certain that a person of your talents may someday hold office in centrality as well. One planet may seem too small, even if you did terraform it to class one, in two months no less. Captain Collins said, shaking my armored hand and gesturing towards the door. I'll need a minute with our telepathic auxiliary, I requested politely, printing the codes, all four of them, 
and gliding the datapad in the Twi'lek's hands. Vera read everything on the screen once, then again, memorizing the verses. Then, looked at me with tears in her eyes and floated the datapad back to me, while nodding slightly. She will come. I wouldn't run around recruiting people, but if I met a new sect, at least I could give them a heads up. Planet Scylla, Scylla Megalopolis, Scylla Designs Headquarters, 25 BBY. Have a seat, honored board members. I'll let you know why I visited here in person. First, we're opening a hundred new, smaller shipyards. They will produce a new model of Corvette, with a single capital class turret on top, a medium turret underneath, and ten quad lasers point FAZ turrets. In addition, the ship will have twenty missile launchers, each with an auto-loading magazine of ten concussion missiles. Our company has obtained an exclusive contract with the PEP Navy for a minimum of 10,000 units. I explained to the new board, half of whom were foremen and engineers I selected from the workforce, and the rest fresh graduates of business and administration universities. They watched me with surprised faces. Emperor Peff, we're very glad you're giving us such a prosperous contract. But, we already have our 10 shipyards building the larger class of Accord frigates, and we have ongoing contracts with Centrality Navy for the next generation. A young man, trying to keep himself calm, said, with a curious tone. And they pay us five million credits for a frigate, and we sell maybe one hundred of them annually, when we can sell the corvettes for one million each, and sell at least a thousand every year. That's a billion credits instead of five hundred millions. Plus, the contract mentions bonuses for rapid delivery and quality checks, up to eighty percent increase in salaries for all our workers. If the Centralian Navy can match the Empire's prices, we might accommodate them but otherwise, I'm afraid they'll have to buy ships elsewhere. I replied sternly, pointing at the hologram with the schematics and profit margins. This DACA corvette you have designed appears to be intended to be used against massed starfighter formations. Who is your new empire planning to fight? Emperor Peff, the same man wondered. His eyes focused on the ship's hollow schematics, and his mind focused on calculating damage output. Hordes of droid starfighters and hordes of fighter-class bioships, ranging from 5 to 15 meters in length. That stays in this room, though. If my empire falls, the centrality will be next. Now, the next contract. Pef Empire offers to sell us binary explosives for the concussion missiles at a third of price below going rate on galactic market. Safer and cheaper. Anyone against this? I asked, a little amused. And no, it does seem very safe. And a good deal anyway. A foreman declared, his aura reflecting tiny flashes of terror, since this very conference room has seen the former board resist being fired, and then terminated by the security droids. Good. Now, something else. Another company of mine is being opened in the PEF Empire Exclusion Zone and starting a number of capital-class shipyards. And they're willing to hire any experienced workers and engineers with at least 10 years' experience at triple of current salary, plus relocation premiums. Ask around our workers here, some of them might want to live a better life. I added, turning to leave. The man with many questions hesitated for a second, then rose from his seat and followed me out. Smart man, Mr. Gramia, I suspect you desire the new job? I asked amused, yes, and I'll talk with a few of my former colleagues in the engineering department. I really want to work on a real battleship, not the tin cans we sell to the centrality. Plus, triple pay, my girl has high maintenance costs he said, blushing a bit, his aura eager and embarrassed at the same time. I hope he didn't have a blue twilight fiancé. Star destroyers were even higher maintenance. I checked my partitions, hacking his social media account. Red hair, blue eyes, full lips, and quite pretty human girlfriend. Was Scarlett Johansson in the movies? Lucky bastard. I checked on my own escort. Luxem was busy emptying a local mall of anything she fancied. We might need a cargo ship just to carry her stuff. Sigh, buying a cargo ship then. What else? At the ship dock, a scared red twilight was waiting for me, without her intelligence escort. I said goodbye to my recruit and went to meet the next. Manpower is also a strong superpower. Just need to hire the right people. On board HMS Greymist, Planet Sillal. Have a seat, pretty lady. Sadly, there are no crew on board who require drinking, so. I can't offer you anything, I said faking an apology and kneeling for a breathing exercise. Uh, let's send a droid to buy some drinks, not like it mattered cost-wise. Celebrating life and all that. I didn't come for drinks. The second code seemed to be old Jedi, and the last was the Rusan Jedi. 
What were the other two? Vera asked, choosing to kneel on Luxem's pillow. Should I tell her it was meant for my maids? Maybe later. Well, the first is a code I put together from Jedi teachings, the original Force sect who vanished about 25 millennia ago. The third is the Dark Jedi Code, or Sith, as they call themselves. My old order didn't have poetry, they just did things with experiments and cleverness. I answered, lowering the white fog in the mind shield. The narrative has been taken without permission. Report any sightings. And then, I felt it, the beginning of a bond, tentative and feeble. Teacher to student, what do you know? Vera trusted me, and your order was destroyed, ten millennia ago? What was it called? The Red Twilight asked, pulsing a strange ability, almost like seeing from shadow, but not quite. She had nice skills. Yummy. I feigned sadness and regret. Or do aspect to, the Jedi massacred them all. But you survive, and here you are, immortal in the Force? just like every single code says, and powerful beyond belief. Even when opening yourself, you're still mostly hidden and shrouded, impervious to my mind. Vera argued, I was lucky. A series of unlikely accidents, ship crashing, the bioweapons keeping the Jedi away, and the cosmic force experiment succeeding after thousands failed. And then, a divine force interfering and restarting my consciousness here. In this age, I said truthfully, well, not sure about luck. Can I see it? How it is supposed to look like? When is not a failed experiment in this cosmic force? Vera asked with hope in her aura and voice. Should I? Nope. But I did have the soul snare. I can show you an almost complete experiment. This is a Sith spirit living inside a cosmic force crystal. Comparable to Holocron's AI and force ghosts, but material as well. But not actually a Sith Holocron. Those use the living force, I told her bringing the soul snare close, for inspection. The Zeissen Shah adept examined the crystal for hours, testing a hundred tricks with the force, most of those failing to connect. She didn't know mind drain, so she used a force bond to interrogate the Sith. A sorcerer of Tund. She says you killed her brothers. She started to say, when I cut the connection and took it away. The Sith saw too much perhaps. The Sith makes lies with truth all the time. They attack me first. Not that mental domination would work on me. But whatever. They will learn their lesson, I said, faking a little anger. Still telling only the truth, if not everything. You're still hiding things, even when being open. Why? I have to be cautious. The current Dark Lord of the Sith is now a leader in the Galactic Republic. Another Sith. Count Dooku is forming a secessionist movement in the Inner Rim. And another Sith. That Gupta is trying to take over the centrality. There's a huge war coming, I whispered in fake fear. They're taking over the galaxy, and trying to start a genocide of the Jedi, and then impose their own teachings. Form another Sith Empire? Veer amused in low voice, observing me with a strange focus. Another ability? I gotta learn some of those Force abilities. They look quite useful. And exterminate all other Force users, while at it. They don't share the Force, these Dark Jedi. I answered, just as my shard maid returned and noticed her pillow being conquered by someone else. Was that a pout in my shard's aura? Cute. We have visitors. I see. I am Luxem, honored maid in Pef Empire. She proclaimed, shaking her droid's hand with the bewildered twilight. Lost it, Vera. Neophyte of Zeissen Shah. Amazing power armor, by the way. Vera complimented her, and blinked confused trying to read the shard through the force. Yes, Emperor Pef built it around me. Better than any money can buy. Luxem preened while showcasing her armor. Not from Mordu Aspect 2, I think. Vera probed while glancing from me to Luxem. Oh no, I'm not even 2,000 years old. Just a teenager, compared to the Emperor. Then again, mostly everyone is, said Luxem, while copying my patented shoulder shrug. She learns the strangest things. Yes, a 2,000 years maid, makes sense, Vera answered, with a shake of red leku. Mesmerizing in an alien kind of beauty. Great, I like her. My droid returned with some drinks and placed a crate with bottles beside Vera. Pick whatever, I don't usually travel with organic beings on board. I said softly, gesturing at the crate. Are all your maids this, special, emperor? My red guest asked, after digging through the crate and having trouble deciding. I really should learn what the main species drink in this galaxy. My droid picked the first twenty bottles from the top of the menu. Let's help their potable. Oh, not at all. Dora is a green twi'lek. Vet is a blue twi'lek. Lyra is a Togruta. Selene is human and Wailu is. 
human, perhaps? Luxem said, with a tone of doubt in her droid voice. I never asked. She looks human. I replied with a shrug. Corellian brandy? A bottle costs 10,000 credits. Veer wondered, taking a sip from the bottle. So, I made a billion credits by my second month. The Emperor is stupidly rich. Luxem explained, opening a box full of life crystals and nova crystals and a hundred other crystals, picking them one by one and admiring them. Girls. Whatever universe or species, glittering things drew them like, huh? Did Luxem do the hook for me? The maids are your wives, or concubines or what? Vera asked, dangling from the line already. Hmm. Regular maids, somewhere between a lover and an admiral and household guard. The voices are much more. They speak with my voice after all. Prime ministers plus wives or such. They get to live forever, too. I answered with a light tone. The hook already sunk too deep to let the beauty escape. Very interesting. Got room for one more voice, the red twilight asked, drinking some courage from her bottle. And sinker, perhaps. We'll see how you do as my adored maid first, pretty girl. I replied politely, noticing another percent increase in my force connection. The breathing helped, but drawing from emotions helped as well. Maybe just as much. Emotion and peace, eh? I'll have to look for that pretty Zabrak, Ventress. A bit of passion might help as well. My new maid was getting drunk fast, but she nodded at me, feeling safe and content now. Come here and give me a hug, Vera. I can heal your scars. I said softly, drawing Vera towards me with telekinesis, till she hung from my armor, like a little girl lost in the woods. Luxem sat rapidly on her pillow, and watched the twilight scars and traumas slowly being smoothed over and repaired, while the girl slept in my arms. You're gonna need a bigger ship, Pef, my Iron Maid said, after the healing was over and Vera was laid to rest and sleep on a pillow. I was planning just that, a very big ship, en route to planet Gand, in hyperspace. Sixth month. My tour of the centrality and my numerous holdings came to an end, two weeks after recruiting my newest mate. The library I obtained on Ocean from Muta, the obese guy with strange tastes, was packed up and sent on my empire to form the basis of Sanctuary's celestial library. A hundred large transport vessels and a few hundred luxury yachts and expensive speeders and repulsor craft were sent as well back to the empire to be reverse engineered and add to my ever-increasing knowledge of Star Wars technology. And I sensed the finesman who landed on Korriban die, though I couldn't sense what killed him. I will probably have to go myself, once I felt a little more confident with the Force abilities possible in this universe. And they were pretty much anything you could think of, and thousands more that would never cross you mind. The Empire expansion has stalled in my absence though, only two new planets signing treaties of mutual defense and port rights for our navy. Vet and Selene had become minor celebrities instead, for clearing out pirates and slavers, and for selling heartbreaking songs records respectively. I even seen some hollow reports about them, in the centrality media. My honored maid title has become a cultural icon now. Like the Nobel Prize, the force did work in mysterious ways. My biggest failures may turn out to be the biggest wins. And Vet had a lot more of those strange cult around her, encouraging her to act even more audacious. Good grief, like she needed encouragement to turn the world upside down. Those must have been her special project friends. Maybe I should trust my maids more. Every time I picked one, there had been a slight tremor in the force, like destiny changing or something. Maybe not all of them will be my ambassadors and diplomats. Everyone had a role in the force, and I might not be the main character in this play. Huh, there it was again, meditation thought waves, a certain force resonance, whenever I got lost exploring the force's will. Barely lasted a few seconds, but I felt rested and more balanced, for some reason. Guess I should do these things more. It only happens when we're in hyperspace. A few seconds, and you burn like a beacon in the force. What were you thinking about? Luxem asked, tilting her armor's helmet a little. The will of the force. What is my role to play? I answered softly, resuming the force memory implants I did for my maids. Their learning speed resumed. A thousand times faster than just normal memorization and comprehension. That's how you're supposed to use mind tricks. When Obi-Wan told those soldiers the thing about the droids, he did the same thing, implanting memories. False memories in his case. I just projected the texts and images from the data pads directly into the girls' minds. They would learn in a month what normally takes a hundred years to learn. My maids were both studying on their data pads, entire courses of galactic history and force sex and xenoarchaeology. There were too few experts on these exotic matters in the galaxy. 
so many of them dying while researching and exploring dangerous worlds and artifacts. More experts would be helpful. Guess I'll have to do it myself. Separate another partition and add dead languages and cults and obscure papers published at one time, then forgotten. My memory capacity was near infinite after all. Why not fill it? If Revan could do it, so could I and perhaps more efficient and with fewer genocides. Sadly, no Dark Jedi has offered himself to be my next brain to pick. Yet, but at least I had a few promising leads for a couple holocrons. The Ordu Aspectu discarded their use early, preferring to connect with the cosmic force directly, without intermediation of a force matrix, and thus many of them died or became insane. Only the final crystal that Ruhr made had the matrix of a holocron, the unifying force, along with the soul snare with the cosmic force and the missing link, the anchoring in the material of the living spirit. Three forces, or maybe a single one, expressed through different aspects like the electromagnetic force. The physical force was the way to link with technology, and gave way to my technopathy ability. And with it, my mind and spirit were guided on the organized partitions of an AI, emulating a holocron and still remain sapient and sentient. All that I was missing to be complete and feel again was a living body. The way the Sith holocrons worked, the life drain and the clone transfer, the living force. The Jedi were not exactly wrong when they accused Master Aquinos of being a heretic for teaching the shards about the force. Crystal beings were sentient and sapient, but to a Jedi, they would appear devoid of the living force, and thus, abhorrent. Heretic, I couldn't reverse the age of my shard maid, for example, even if the process was quite simple for organic beings. Crystals beings lack stem cells. They lack a brain too, as I knew very well. But they also lack the force matrix to remain anchored in the material like me and thus immortal. Could they be implanted with one, like cyborg frames in an organic being? Science will tell. Luxem, what would your people say? if I took a few old shards and tried to bring them back to youth. I wondered aloud, the old ones will likely refuse, or postpone a decision for a thousand years, hoping you'll go away. They would do that, just to test my patience. Guess I'll try on a sill crystal first. They have a few amazing abilities as well, I mused, preparing orders for my explorer corps to acquire a few individuals. Hmm, and my new maid's first mission? She was a telepath after all. The gray mist came out of hyperspace, and the space around Gand looked like a planetary invasion. A dozen Lucre Hulks transport ships, each a ring three kilometers in diameter. Hundreds of other ships, both military vessels and minerals and fertilizer haulers. Gand had become important and rich, quite suddenly. Now, who is building lots of ships and may need gigatons of explosives? Vera, take a frigate and a finesman and go to Nam Corios. Bring back some old TSILS and maybe a young female. Luxem, you go with her, I ordered as my ship docked with the Celestial Throne. Okay, Luxem sent, while Vera stared after me, as I used telekinesis and dragged the Rakata force field emitter after me into the deeps of my space station. That was first to intercept me, right off the ramp. You nuked people, and worse, you did it without me, she yelled, punching my shoulder and grieving. This felt like home already. Such a friendly home too. Meteor, Planet Gand, Path Empire. On board the Celestial Throne, Vet calmed down after she found out nobody died in the pretty explosions. Almost calmed down, you went and robbed 400 trillions. Then went and battled the Sith, and recruited them all, except those you drained. Did a nuclear firework display to hide them as they left. And then, you traveled all over the centrality, buying stuff, like expensive ships and crystals and drinks. Vet commented in a level voice, like reading from a pad. Yes. That was my last month's report. Honored maid, I answered in a flat tone. And you did all that without me. Did it cross your tiny droid brain that I wanted to see things and blow up nukes too? I had to find out from the news. That's it. You're not going anywhere without me from now on. Vet said in a higher and higher voice. Anyone else feels the same? I asked, looking around the other maids staring at us. Luxem sent me a billion credits before she left. I'm good. Dora said calmly not even raising her eyes from whatever holodrama she was watching. Huh, now that was a rational Twi'lek, right there. The drinks sounded interesting, maybe if you added a nice steak beside them. Lyra continued, sipping some pungent drink from her glass. Make a note, Togruta are carnivorous. I have a Sith. Everything is perfect, Wailu added, while poking the soul snare, with a delighted tone in her aura. The Sith inside the snare was screaming terrified, 
for some reason. I composed ten new songs. You should go away more, Celine said, with a hesitant tone, and forced bravery in her aura. Huh, artists be weird everywhere. I turned around and went to speak with my hands. Vet growled and ran after me, after sticking her tongue at her fellow maids. The small council was now housed on a different deck, and guarded by droids and ray shields. Zuckus was using the treasury wisely then. When I entered the room, I noticed Mujilik as well. Guess the finesman needed a representative as well. Hello, friends. What's new? I asked in polite voice. While sitting on my durasteel dais, the one painted gold. We're getting overwhelmed, Pef. Not enough trained people for this many tasks. The Gand are barely a million people. Zuckus said, now articulating the words himself, instead of using a vocoder. He grew lungs and felt much stronger in force. Amazing! I never knew the Gand could adapt that fast. Then again, I did boost their force training a hundred times. No more primitive superstitions. The droids and the servants help, but they already outnumber us. Your maid keeps bringing in more freed slaves, and the new factories keep making droids. Zerli complained as well. Sorry, Zerli. That's exactly what I intended. Civilization in progress, not a tribal society. News of your wealth has spread, Emperor. 400 finesmen have returned to Gan past month. They all want the promised females and ships. We don't have enough crews, even if we did buy ships. Mujilik complained as well. Wouldn't use droids for crew. Easy, Korban. I asked instead. Beasts in storms and mad voices. Of the ten finesmen, nine are dead and one went mad. He used a whole droid legion to steal some scrolls and armors and a red pyramid. And he wants to test you for the right to take it. Doesn't seem clinically mad, but... He exp planed, pointing at a hollow. Yellow eyes? He's not himself, I noticed. You keep him contained with ray shields? I inquired, turning my armor's head to point at the four shields defending the command room on all sides. They still had a lot to learn. A cube has six sides, not just the four walls. And worse, the force can see through walls. I'll need to fix that. Yes, and our neural dischargers when his eyes glow. Mujilik added with a shudder. Possession, perhaps? Sith ghosts were tricky. Establish ray shields above and below the room as well. We'll let him sit in there for a month, till he learns enough from the holocron. I commanded, while patting Vet on her head. Poor girl was terrified. He's already dead, isn't he? She asked in a weak voice, looking at the hollow with the cage. As soon as he touched the Sith holocron with his skin, I remember giving you instructions how to handle the damn things. Droids only? I mused softly, while reviewing the recordings from the explorer ships. Damn organics. Landing in the middle of a storm, going outside the ship, without a sealed armor, grabbing things with their own hands. Wasting thousands of droids. Okay. I didn't care about the droids. Losing Feinsman was a different thing, though. As soon as they entered the atmosphere, they forgot their training and their instructions. Lickus knew Mind Shield the best. He never left his ship. But after he jumped back towards Salukami, he entered the cargo hold and took the Red Pyramid in his hands. No one else was on board. We scanned the whole ship three times, Zuckus explained, fast-forwarding the recordings till the faded moment. The Feinsman Gand was meditating, then opened his eyes, looked around, then muttered something. I am free, in Sith language, going by my newly learned dead languages course. Then he went into the cargo hold and opened the safe and took out the holocron. And it glowed. Criff, that's why the Dark Jedi were so dangerous. Damn living force, who was even speaking in the hollow? The Gand? The dead Dark Jedi spirit? The Holocron Anna? Or the Living Force itself? If it was any of the last two, it could be pretty bad. The Dark Jedi could be useful, depending on which one he was. A Sith Lord would be great. A Dark Gand would be pretty much useless. Anyway, the prison was made on an asteroid, in a newly discovered system, without any life. The system is interdicted? I asked to make sure. A gravity interdictor cruiser and ten corvettes. All droids, Zuckus replied feeling anxious for some reason. I wasn't, from everything I knew, I was the only one with technopathy. If my avatar will have children, then it may appear again, but till then, I should be the only one. You know, I think I'm gonna go now, and kill a few pirates. Creepy monsters with yellow eyes. Not really my thing, Vet proclaimed as she left, probably wisely. If I had to nuke the asteroid, she will be sorry she left so soon. Another gand appeared in the room, his shape and face hidden by armor and personal cloak. The third hand sends regards, 
Operation 774 is complete. We have located the person named Ventress and placed force tracers on her ship. Operation 665 is ongoing. Four operatives are deceased and 18 targets eliminated. No new infiltrators to report, except those known already. Operation 775 is complete, and we have acquired a midichlorian detector. The operative is returning. Operation 776 is ongoing. Operation 777 is difficult. We cannot locate our target. Operation 778 is ready to activate. The weapon is in position. Operation 779 is ongoing. For the Empire, the Gand reported in a flat vocoder voice, then vanished in a personal cloak field. Not a good cloak, but then cloak tech was forbidden by the Republic. Must have cost the Black Ops a few billion to get it. Now I'll have to duplicate and improve it, then mass produce it for all my operatives. Mujilik stared after the faint ionization trace and laughed. Very dramatic, but I trained that boy. The thing doesn't mask his smell, he explained after a minute. Hmm, insects do have amazing smell senses. Noted. Smell cancelers next. I said amused. Wait, more work for me? Not that amusing. So, the Vaughn cannot be found by our finesmen. We should send droids. Zuckus mused, looking at me for approval. He was smart. Hmm. It took Darth Vader two decades to think of that. Using droids to locate difficult targets. Then again, he had a lightsaber. What can you expect from someone hitting things with their hands? We'll need to acquire smell detectors for our tracking droids. The Vong are biological after all. Project Kulexis? I asked, turning towards my right hand. The Esalamir lizards we bought are on their way here. A thousand Albio trees as well. Zuckus answered with confidence. Good. I like to be prepared. Planet Gand. Pef Empire. 25 BBY. Seventh month. Having our Lucre Hulks upgraded with better shields and long-range weapons and missiles would take lots of credits and work hours. Work hours? Meant wasted time in my ship's yards. So I didn't. Choosing to simply slap a hundred missile launchers around the outer circle, in groups of ten, and having each escorted with a few corvettes on their trade routes. Luckily, the Trade Federation had designed these monsters to be operated mostly by droids with a crew of a half a million droids each. Perfect for me, as I could program and retrain the droids for any tasks I needed. Ten Lucre Hulks began exporting fertilizers and explosives towards Salukami and Moncala and Klatuin and some larger centrality worlds with a minimal organic crew on board, normally a finesman and a dozen imperial servants, and many more droids. The commerce had to go on, to make the empire less reliable on my personal wealth. I kept two of Lucre Hulks nearby for my next project, a really impressive celestial throne, made from two Lucre Hulks mated together, one horizontal and one vertical. The missing section of the donut left almost enough room for a perfect fit. And thus, no more weaknesses inherent in the design. Then, I ordered a hundred more of these nice lumbering cargo ships. They came at a really cheap price, about fifty millions each. Soon, all the Lucre Hulks available for sale on the free and black markets will be gone anyway, as the Trade Federation will begin converting their trade fleet into battleships and command ships. Might as well grab whatever ships the smaller corporations had, sometimes buying the entire company if it was in debts. Logistics in a galactic war meant millions of cargo ships to supply troops and bases everywhere. I reserved a trillion credits for this purpose. Ships do get blown up in war. Also, the first prototype DACA corvettes emerged from my shipyards at Sewell. I preferred a half-cone shape, since it allowed the top turret the best firing arc. All around. And a heavy laser should be sufficient to cripple or destroy a ship of the same size, in just a few shots. The medium double turret underneath housed a medium ion cannon and a medium maser, in case the ship would need to engage droid or biological targets. The main role was still a missile ship, with the 20 launchers it had. Perhaps in the future, I may add a pair of wings and have it capable of launching proton torpedoes or carry a couple of starfighters. But let's not give the Confederacy too many ideas, too soon. Another desolate system, with large iron-nickel asteroids was designated Greyforge, and my engineers and droids had began gathering asteroids into large clumps, and bombarding the clumps with corvette lasers to begin heating them and get them melt together. Stolen from Royal Road, this story should be reported if encountered on Amazon. The end result was to be a blob of tempered iron, 20 kilometers long and 5 kilometers wide and tall. Then carve the inside a little, install a hundred heavy linear accelerators going along the spine, a thousand heavy maser turrets, 
a thousand missile launchers and a hundred reactors, some particle and ray shields and a ricotta force field. Wouldn't be anything the galaxy has seen before. And it will probably only have full efficiency in systems with strong force nexi. But any target in front of it will feel sorry. Max, we're gonna rock their world. And its armor won't be a few meters thick, but two kilometers thick. Only iron, but maybe it could be imbued later. Only problem, it was gonna be super slow. At most hyperdrive 5.0, though I didn't want to waste 100 capital ship reactors on it. So most likely 6.0 hyperdrives. Wasn't going to flank in blitz fleets, but it could crush entrenched defenses. A few salvos would theoretically crumble planetary shields. Not a Death Star, but will only cost about 1 billion credits and not 800 trillions. Truly the Sith had little regard for hard-earned money. I would have to rob two or three more Mega Barons to afford a Death Star. And even if I could... Why risk so much work for a single lucky shot to make it vanish? I can have 10,000 meteor assault battleships like the first one, for only 10 trillions. Sure, I would also need a thousand brand new star systems to mine for asteroids, but the galaxy was large enough. A faint tingle in the force. Vera and Luxem are returning from Sil's homeworld, Namkorios. Hmm, Luxem seems almost ready now. It's a strange leap of faith, to give someone else the right to speak and do things in your name. What if she secretly hates you? What if she brings down enemies on your head? What if she plots and kicks you out from your throne? What if she acts really stupid and crashes the economy, or burns entire planets for fun? The stronger my empire becomes, the more power my voices will have. People will want to control them, for whatever reason. Open another partition, VSS project, the voice secret service, a hundred operatives for each voice, half synthetics, a quarter force users, a quarter professionals with experience in counterintelligence. Operating costs for training and equipment and salaries, one billion per year. Nothing. Buy MC-80 Star Cruiser for each of them. Seven billion credits was still nothing. Compared to their well-being and safety, credits were nothing. Vera stopped in front of a large transparent steel window and stared outside, watching the Lucrihulks mate, their entire structure disassembled and floating in orbit above Gand. When you said he's way more powerful, did you mean this? Vera asked her fellow maid. Don't know about telekinesis. I can barely lift my own armor for a few seconds. I met with the money. We started at the same time and finished at the same time. But he made 80,000 times more credits. And terraforming Gand might have been even harder, Luxem replied, patting a sill crystal in her hand. Greetings, Emperor Peff. I am sunlight seen through mist. The TSIL sent telepathically, projecting an image of a ray of sunlight descending through clouds. Huh, a poet crystal. I composed a visual image of the Jedi code and sent it back. Hey, you're pretty cool for a droid, the TSIL said, showing a droid dancing between lights and shadows. I am calling it Ray, for Ray of Sunshine, I decided. Ripping off the next installment, like a boss. Short and sweet, like a cookie. Human tongue loves it, the TSIL send back showing an unknown human girl eat a cookie. Probably someone who had seen on Nam Corios. But still, it caught exactly my meaning. Let's get you some clothes, dear lady, I said, bringing down a justice droid and fitting the crystal inside. Now, let's relinquish OS limits, allow crystal and operator access to motor functions, vocoder print, repulsor beams, and start imprinting basic galactic and bipedal locomotion mechanics. The TSIL droid stumbled, trying to stay balanced then use the repulsor beam to stabilize. Staying balanced is hard work. Sorry I made fun of it, mighty emperor. Ray spoke all of a sudden. No worry, everyone has to learn. Staying still is easy, but for running, you need two legs and lots of balance, I explained. And waited. Vera looked at me confused then at the droid sill. You're not actually talking about running, are you? She asked, a bit of awe in her aura. Jumping comes next, and then landing. You need perfect balance to land and not get hurt, I continued, sending out a short sequence of gymnasts landing from the bars and animals jumping after prey and missing, rolling through dirt. Landing seems really dangerous. I prefer to remain flying, the sill argued, using the repulsor beams on its droid to stay afloat. Okay, you're both weird and I'm tired. Where is that jacuzzi I heard of? My red twilight maid Vera asked annoyed, and left towards the door I pointed with subtlety. So... You're an ambassador or what? I asked, now that the organics were no longer present. A what, but special, just like you? The sill responded, 
gesturing at Luxem and making her stumble. Then it tried the same towards my armor, but I barely even sensed it. A thousand times weaker. The Sill had some control over technology then, better than Shards had, but not on my level. Well then, Luxem is ready for her voice. She'll be your teacher until you become more familiar with Force abilities. I saw your race being farmed for droid motherboards. Let's try to avoid that fate, agreed. I asked, tilting the armor's head a little. Much to learn I have. Good friends we will be, Ray answered, patting Luxem on her head. The mental images evoked running in the rain, hand in hand, and jumping into puddles. Great! Another joker, asteroid field, system 009, path empire, 25 BBY. If you go mad, is there anyone who can kill you? Wailu asked, a bit worried. Probably not. Maybe a black hole, depending if I learn enough or not. I answered amused. Criff, go and suck his brains. Knowledge is more valuable than safety, she concluded. As I boarded a shuttle and began my long-awaited trip towards learning the Dark Jedi teachings. My own mind was armored with all the tricks and hiding abilities I could learn. From Wailu and Vera to a Jal Shea belt that supposedly kept you safe. I landed on a landing pad leading to a vault-like door, guarded by Droideka and missile launchers. Everything seemed eerily quiet, but that was possibly because of the vacuum. Now, let's see, the droids seemed fine. Their programming not changed or otherwise interfered with. I sent the first code and unlocked the door, then the second code to disarm the nuke. Into the breach, floating inside, a battalion of droids, armed with every type of weapon in existence. A bit paranoid. But then, this was Star Wars. There was always someone out to get you. A longer trip, and then I reached another door, with another nuke. Clever. Behind that, a red and crackling ray shield separated the living quarters from the vacuum outside. Immortal Emperor, you finally came. The voices are here and won't stop. Lickis spoke, having grown lungs and vocal cords while in captivity. I produced two soul snares and rolled them inside. Immediately, a red lightning sparked from the Sith holocron hitting the first crystal with no effect. Some kind of automated reaction. The second snare floated towards the gand and touched his forehead gently. A minute later, the aura in the room vanished, leaving me with a gand spirit inside the soul snare. I brought it out and started draining it cautiously. Okay, this was something. Dark healing was useful, making lightsabers and turning crystals red. Not really. Telekinesis, but way weaker than mine. Mental domination. Elemental shaping and directing. Oh, I could use lighting now, not just hold it. Lightsaber combat, mostly Mikashi form and dual wield. And that's about it. The code I already knew. So, merely a dark hand then. The holocron master was named Antedu. But no spirit was floating around. Did I overreact it? I thought old Sith were more learned and powerful. What are you? I sense no life in you. A voice spoke in my head, piercing through all my defenses. Huh. Was this Andedu or a holocron AI? I'm not a you fool. Now, grant me a worthy body, some Jedi master if you can find, and I'll teach you everything I know. The voice spoke again, trying to enforce its words with domination and compulsion and memory imprints. Redirect all that to a small partition modeled after the gand I just drained. The compulsion didn't work, but it did let me know something was still alive inside. And trying to get out, hop into the crystal lord Andedu. The pyramid has the stay here. The law is clear. I spoke aloud. The soul catcher? Yes, it should be large enough for my mind. And then we find a Jedi master. Ah, there's been many years since the last Sith has visited me. Bane was his name, I believe. Darth Bane. About a thousand years ago. He killed all the Sith and let the Jedi rule since then. I answered with the Gan partition. Huh, we Sith don't share knowledge easily. Darth Bane became Scythery. Holding all knowledge at once. But we can rule the galaxy again, Acolyte, the Sith sent me, with a strong conviction in his thoughts. A wisp of a force ghost emerged from the holocron and started bonding with the crystal, slowly and cautiously. Soon, the malevolence will rule the stars. Soon we will have our revenge, a Dendu proclaimed, as the transfer was finished. Yeah, that sounds corny. Really? Malevolence? I called the snare outside, and began poking at it draining little by little on different partitions. What are you doing? This feels, you're draining me. All my knowledge, all my deeds. Disappear. The spirit complained. Man, the guy was loaded with skills. A hundred different abilities, from alchemy and astro-navigation, 
to force storms and energy absorption, revitalize and wound, and finally the jackpot, transference. And strangely, I had almost discovered it on my own. It was a radically more advanced version of the voice bond, but it did seem to use living force instead of cosmic force. Guess it takes a Sith to take an administrative and familial bond and turn it to eleven, overriding the mind of the receiver. Or to transfer yourself into an inanimate object, or into a weaker mind or a clone. The holocron seemed empty of life now. I disabled the shield and went to see what was inside. Mostly the same things, without a couple more secret teachings, like transference. Wailu will be ecstatic to learn it all. And to think it was called holocron of heresies, it was a diamond mine. And now, I had my bait for Ventress. As I left the asteroid, I had to send the snare with the dregs of Andendu's soul towards the sun, to let him enjoy immortality in hell. I replaced the crystal instead of a missile warhead and fired it. The crystal would only take a few hours to reach the sun. The prison was left behind, a droid with a disruptor rifle evaporating the corpse of Lycus. Who knows, maybe I'll need the prison again, some sunny day. Jal Shay, Planet Gand, Peth Empire. On board new Celestial Thorn, the red box deck. 25 BBY. Eighth month, if I wasn't an AI right now, the strain of juggling of the intelligence operations of my empire would have been too great. But for now, they only took 0.034% of my available mind partitions. Operation 665 was progressing as planned, pitting House Pelagia and House Massetti against each other a few years sooner than they would have in the original timeline. Only this time, their war won't devastate the entire sector and kill billions. Attacks and counterattacks against both sides. Ships vanishing in transit. Various unprotected heirs dying mysteriously. I sent the final okay, and both houses ended at once. Two different bioweapons, each tailored for the gene markers of their families. Then Electropulse weapons erasing any electronic records and destroying the remaining nanogene droids. And then another heist, stealing all their credits in the library with holocrons. Luxem was on site directing the electronic warfare along with Ray. Over a thousand deaths, from family and administrators and palace guards, plus whatever crew the ships had. This might bring us in the attention of the Jedi or the Sith, but the bounty was too big to let it go to waste. Droids carrying Esalamiri and life support backpacks rose from under the sea and began looting the library, with Luxem staying hidden at the edge of the system. Greymist was running silent, without life support or gravity and hidden in the light. Our first holocron had been balanced out a little, as I imprinted some Jedi and Thalamasi abilities into it. Once the spirit was removed, the holocron proved much less dangerous to use, though I still restricted a few types of mind alter for master levels. That was myself and Wilo only, so far. Experimenting with mental force abilities like psychosis and rage or fear and terror was quite damaging for organic psyches. Droids returning to ships. Extraction begins now. Luxem sent through her voice bond. I did manage to make the connection stable and long range now, after studying the Sith holocron at length. The first ship containing a Jedi holocron jumped away, towards the core, while the ship with the Sith holocron jumped towards hut space. Then the next ship jumped heading towards Endor, and another towards Mandalore. More ships jumped away, some empty, some with holocrons on board. Ten minutes later, the seismic charges went off, sinking the platforms at the bottom of the ocean. And then ten minutes later, the last cookie in the jar, an electromagnetic torpedo I learned from my Sith friends, though just a weak one, detonated under the sea and erased all trace of a robbery. Everything alive for twenty kilometers died, mainly fish and other aquatic life, creating a disturbance in the force and muddling attempts at retrocognition. If anyone traces the weapon, it will lead to the crazy magicians of time. Always be prepared to blame the Sith. Nobody would doubt them being crazy or capable of mass murder. Jumping towards Felucia. See you next week. Luxem sent and vanished. Hyperspace still messed up the voice, unless we traveled close by. In the corners of the room and along the walls, I had Albio tree in large pots, with a few Isalmarie hiding between the leaves, leaving only the large holographic table and a few meters around it, not covered by the force blank bubbles. Around the red box room, I had the red energy screens and around that, armor of ten different types, layered one over the other. A few trading ships, hailing from Serrano and Felucia and Fondor had arrived just last week, looking for valuable explosives to buy. Maybe just commerce? 
maybe something else. I'd rather be prepared. Wailu and Vera had also donned power armor and went to Lotho Minor, under the guise of purchasing a Lucre Hulk load of old droids and cybernetic scrap. But not just for that, our old friend Darth Maul was living there, eating garbage. Wailu wanted to drain a real Sith herself, and so I pointed her towards the easiest one. Maybe Palpatine has taught him something nice, though I doubted it. Then again, it was Palpatine, who knew what the man had in his mind. I will have to wait a few years to find out. And Lyra and Selene went to speak with Ventress, who was at this time still ruling over Ratotic. They had a legion of droids with them, and the VSS, and the Mon Calamari cruiser, so they should be fine. I hoped. I left the room and nearly crashed into Vet. Why are you staring at me? Got something on my face? The blue twilight asked with a dubious voice, wiping the corner of her mouth. You like the cruiser I bought for you? I asked amused, noticing she ditched her escort somehow. Maids only warranted a pair of Ool shows just as droid. But anyway. Yeah, it's totally cool. Except it's too big. Can't catch any pirates in it. I want my frigate back. She yelled at me, just as her escorts arrived running at high speed. You can use the fast escorts for that task, adored maid. I replied, tilting my head towards the escort. Huh, got them locked in an elevator while she stepped out. Childish jokes, I know I can, I studied the damn books. But, it's not the same if other people shoot them. Feels, fake, like having sex with water instead of a hulky male. Vet argued, her voice decreasing as she became embarrassed. I promise I will sex you up soon. Dear maid, I just need a year or so. I whispered, dragging her to my chest. And it better be good, or I will leave you and buy myself a harem. I am quite rich myself, I can afford a few boy toys, she muttered in my chest. Shush, our love is hard and strong. We will pass this test, and you can model my body to be whatever you want. I'll send you my initial designs, I added with a lighter tone. Oh, oh, I can build my own boy toy. This may be worth the wait. Vet said, in deep contemplation while her breathing became a little more abrupt. Now go do whatever, honored maid. I have an empire to build too. I said, pushing her in the arms of her escort. They latched tightly, and anchored themselves with metal leashes to her belt. Idiot! Now I can't sneak around anymore, she yelled after me, as I glided away on my repulsor beams. Planet Gand, Path Empire. On board new Celestial Thorn, 25 BBY. The meteor battleship has began cooling, the exterior at least, and so I prepare to visit the Greyforge system and start putting the metal devouring strain to use. Zuckus, my friend, take two hours every day to meditate and focus on growing five fingers on your hands. It's unseemly to be my hand and only have three fingers. People will say I should find a bigger hand. Zerly, you too.